One seemingly normal day, in a seemingly normal place, a seemingly normal person exploded. Nobody was around to see it happen, so nobody had any clue what had caused it. The aftermath was all anyone had to go off, and needless to say, it was baffling, not to mention messy. But with no explanation as to how it happened, the incident was filed as nothing more than a freak occurrence, an unsolved mystery, spontaneous combustion. Whoever that ordinary person had been, their personal effects would be gathered up and either handed off to relatives or sold on at thrift stores. And among those possessions left behind in the aftermath was a discarded pair of brown leather shoes. The exact same pair of unassuming shoes that would eventually find themselves traveling to the most unlikely of places. They changed hands, or rather changed feet, over and over again. Worn, then outgrown, bought secondhand, then sold off when their usefulness had once again worn out, only to be purchased by someone new and maybe even lost once while being worn by someone on vacation. They traveled the circumference of the globe without so much as an incident until one fateful day, the 14th of December, 2008. By this point, the shoes were now the property of one Muntazir al-Zaidi. Al-Zaidi was an Iraqi journalist covering a press conference being held in Baghdad. In attendance, appearing alongside the Nuri al-Maliki, the Prime Minister of Iraq, was the United States' then-president, George W. Bush. Little did the journalist know, there was technically a third person standing on a podium at the conference that day. SCP Foundation researcher Dr. Elias Shaw. You see, the immortal, highly eccentric member of the Foundation's administrative department was inhabiting the body of George W. Bush at the time. During the 2000 presidential election, the Foundation had discovered an anomalous entity inhabiting the brain of United States Vice President Al Gore. The anomaly, designated as SCP-4444, or referring to itself as Garber Gore, was part of a species intent on destroying the planet by generating greenhouse gases. However, these anomalies only attempt this after parasitically using the most powerful individual in the world as a host. Having confused the roles of Vice President and President, SCP-4444 attempted to remedy this by running as Vice President Gore in the year 2000. While the Foundation led a joint effort with the Federal Bureau of Investigation to prevent SCP-4444 from winning the election, President George W. Bush was shot above the ear during a hunting accident. This injury would render him brain dead, but the Foundation still needed viable opposition to run against the anomalously controlled Al Gore. So, with Bush suffering brain death, they decided to put a different brain in the driver's seat. Dr. Shaw's, to be exact. Dr. Shaw has long been able to use SCP-963, an anomalous ruby amulet, to transfer his consciousness from one body to the next. And so, that's how he wound up in the body of President Bush, which in turn would lead the Foundation to the discovery of a new anomaly. Which brings us right back to the December press conference in Baghdad. The event was taking place five weeks before Elias Shaw, under the guise of George W. Bush, was due to leave office. His successor, Barack Obama, had even already been inaugurated. When Bush took the podium, Muntazir al-Zaidi hurled one of his shoes at the U.S. president in protest, calling it a farewell kiss from the Iraqi people. Shoes are considered unclean throughout the Middle East, so this was done intentionally to convey Muntazir al-Zaidi's disdain for Bush and the American occupation of Iraq. Speaking of, as the president, Elias Shah was able to duck out of the path of the incoming footwear projectile, and as a second careened through the air towards him, he dodged it again, while Iraqi Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki attempted to parry it with his hand. While he would later be released and not charged with any crime, merely expressing his opinion, immediately after the incident, al-Zaidi would find himself tackled and apprehended by al-Maliki's guards. Afterwards, he was taken into custody by the SCP Foundation themselves. While they would normally avoid detaining civilians, the Foundation had some pressing questions about the man's shoes. It turns out, despite the presence of an immortal doctor's consciousness transferred into the president's body via a magic amulet, the anomaly that had caught the Foundation's attention was the pair of shoes the Iraqi journalist had hurled through the air. Just looking at them, they appeared to be ordinary brown leather shoes. They were a matching pair, each being 28 and a half centimeters long and 9 centimeters wide. Despite lacking any label indicating the brand or exact size of the shoes, 
They were otherwise completely normal and unremarkable, save for being the shoes that had been thrown at President Bush. And yet, the Foundation saw it fit to question Al Zaidi extensively about the motive behind his actions at the press conference and whether or not he was affiliated with any known group of interest. SCP Foundation researcher Dr. Lautner conducted the interview with Muntazir Al Zaidi, who immediately expressed that he didn't want to spend too much time locked up. The Foundation doctor assured him that the interview wouldn't take long, but was dependent on Al Zaidi answering the Foundation's questions. He begrudgingly agreed, allowing Dr. Lautner to proceed with the interrogation. When prompted to disclose whether he had any prior knowledge of who the SCP Foundation were, Al Zaidi answered that he didn't know anything about the Foundation or its purpose. Then, Dr. Lautner asked the journalist if he was aware of any other groups that had experience with or interest in strange, inexplicable entities or objects. In short, other organizations with knowledge of anomalies. Montezir was uncertain, saying he didn't think he knew of any others. Dr. Lautner pressed him further, bringing up a few examples of notable adversaries that the Foundation had encountered in the past, including the Global Occult Coalition, the Chaos Insurgency, and the Serpent's Hand. But there was one other group Dr. Lautner had mentioned by name, one that caught the attention of Al-Zaidi. It had sounded familiar. Two names followed by a word meaning a lack of light, Marshall, Carter, and Dark. According to Muntazir al Zaidi, they were the ones who sold him the shoes. Marshall Carter and Dark Limited are, on the surface, just a high society gentlemen's club. Its membership comprised of greedy, capitalistic elites. Some of the public might even have heard the names Marshall Carter and Dark, but in all likelihood would know little about the auctioneers and merchants that conducted the prestigious club's acquisition and auctioning of various expensive wares. Of course, what is known only to the Foundation is that Marshall, Carter & Dark Limited are actually a powerful multinational corporation, one that specializes in selling anomalous items, entities, and experiences to the 1%. The group was founded and remains headquartered in London, England, by three individuals named Amos Marshall, Ruprecht Carter, and Percival Dark. Through their use of immense wealth to extend their international reach, both financially and politically, Marshall, Carter, and Dark have become the go-to criminal underworld and black market of the anomalous world, managing to keep their operations and the identities of their members concealed from most authoritative forces. Although they are usually an affable and non-confrontational organization, these anomalous auctioneers and procurers of the paranormal will only ever retaliate against those who threaten to undermine their shady business dealings. Say, for example, an organization devoted to securing and containing anomalies in order to protect mankind. In other words, the Foundation. Given the illicit and highly dangerous nature of what they do in the pursuit of profit, Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited have drawn the scrutiny of the Foundation, and there has been a clash of heads between the two on more than one occasion. Known for hosting their illegal auctions as well as anomalous art exhibitions, when it comes to the various anomalies that Marshall, Carter, and Dark deal in, they aren't interested in hoarding these for themselves. After locating them and then either purchasing or otherwise acquiring them, they are not overly concerned as to who they sell these objects to, as long as the sale serves to line their own bank accounts. Usually, the highest bidder and one of their underground item auctions will walk away with the anomalous lot being presented. And while most of these would be classified as safe by the Foundation, that doesn't mean they're harmless. However, ethical concerns are not an issue for Marshall, Carter, and Dark, as long as their buyers are rich and influential. Further proof of their ethical flexibility is the fact that the organization is not above dealing in anomalous creatures and even humanoid entities, as well as art pieces or objects with paranormal properties. This is regarded by the SCP Foundation to be a form of illegal animal and human trafficking. However, this has not prevented even some of Foundation personnel from accepting bribes, being paid off by members of Marshall, Carter, and Dark in exchange for sensitive intel, or even the direct purchase of SCPs for them to auction. Despite their level of influence throughout the anomalous world, part of what has allowed Marshall, Carter, and Dark to remain so secretive and undetectable has been their strength in smaller numbers. Their workforce is believed to only consist of around a hundred individuals, helping them keep their operations streamlined, efficient, and most importantly, for the wealthy individuals running the show, cost-effective, minimizing the amount of personnel they have to pay. 
Speaking of the mysterious uber-capitalistic directors of Marshall, Carter, and Dark, those at the highest position of power within the organization are perhaps the most mysterious aspect of their group. The average person works to make money in order to survive, to pay bills so they have shelter and heat, and to provide themselves and their families with food to eat. The rich are always seeking to make more money by exploiting those poorer than them in order to achieve a greater echelon of wealth. But to Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited, the rich are little more than ants. There has long been wild speculation regarding who exactly controls the group, with rumors ranging from them being ghosts or demons, to the three founders running their auctions from beyond the grave, to even faceless anomalies from another reality. But of all that begs the question, the very next question that Dr. Lautner would ask Muntazir al-Zaidi, why would Marshall, Carter, and Dark sell an Iraqi journalist a pair of shoes? That's because, as al-Zaidi was fully aware when he hurled the footwear at President Bush, they weren't just ordinary shoes. They were shoes that make people explode. SCP-7026 might have appeared to be a pair of unextraordinary brown leather shoes, but if they were traveling at the right speed, they could become lethal weapons. When the shoes were stationary, they didn't display any anomalous effects or adverse properties. There was equally nothing unusual about them when a person wore them. However, if either of the shoes traveled at a speed exceeding 22 and a half kilometers an hour, well, you would see a serious shift. Both the left shoe, SCP-7026-1, and the right, SCP-7026-2, would continue traveling at this speed without stopping, able to negate any air resistance that would otherwise slow them down. SCP-7026 could, in theory, keep traveling at 22.5 km per hour indefinitely, if their path remained unobstructed, hitting any solid matter from buildings to plants, inanimate objects to animals, would cause the shoes to stop, affected normally by gravity and resulting in nothing out of the ordinary. But if they were to strike a human, either or both of the SCP-7026 shoes would stick to that person's body, unable to be removed. As you'd expect from being hit with a shoe traveling that fast, whoever they hit would experience immediate searing pain. Sadly for them, that wouldn't be the worst part. If either or both of the SCP-7026 shoes was to remain stuck to a human subject for 10 seconds, then they would begin to melt through clothes, skin, tissue, and bone in order to burrow into the center of that person's chest cavity. Despite this, the person now with SCP-7026 reaching their internal organs would not die, no matter how much otherwise fatal damage their body sustained during the process. Although that doesn't mean it's painless, quite the opposite in fact. Once lodged in the subject's chest cavity, the shoes then stop melting tissue and other biological matter and instead trigger a 200% increase in cell production. This causes a rapid healing of external wounds that seals the shoe, or shoes, inside the body of the affected subject. Attempting to remove SCP-7026-1 or SCP-7026-2 by means of conducting surgery on a person results in the shoe sending electrical shocks throughout their body to rapidly restart cell production and heal any surgical incisions in an attempt to retrieve and remove the shoe. While buried within a person, SCP-7026 will start to grow, increasing in size by around 20% every minute and will not stop until the affected person has exploded, ripped apart by the growing shoe. After the point at which the subject's body has burst, the shoe returns to its normal size. During the interview with Dr. Lautner, Muntazir al-Zaidi willingly divulged this information, stating that he was aware that SCP-7026 would have stuck to Dr. Shaw, as President Bush burrowed inside him and expanded until he exploded, had he not ducked out of the way. He also said that the speed of the shoes wasn't solely determined by throwing, and that running or driving at an adequate speed could trigger their anomalous effect and pose a potential danger to the wearer. As for where the shoes had originated from, beyond being sold to Al-Zaidi by Marshall, Carter, and Dark, the precise details of their origin were vague. The journalist could recall that a woman had sold him SCP-7026, but was unable to remember if he'd been told who made them. He was made aware by this mysterious woman, likely an envoy or even a ranking member of Marshall, Carter, and Dark, that SCP-7026 were intentionally designed to kill people. They could be snuck into high-security installations undetected, 
be at a government building or a press conference with an immortal Foundation doctor masquerading as a then outgoing U.S. president. SCP-7026's leather construction meant that they couldn't set off metal detectors, and this allowed them to be slipped past security when Muntazir al-Zaidi attended the aforementioned press conference. The journalist was candid when it came to his motives. In this line of work, he'd seen atrocities committed against the people of Iraq and blamed George W. Bush for his role in orchestrating the U.S. invasion. Following the interview, Muntazir al-Zaidi was released from Foundation custody and administered with amnestics to erase any memories of SCP-7026, as well as his interactions with Marshall Carter and Dark. Researchers then conducted several tests with the anomalous footwear that confirmed what al-Zaidi had told them about the shoes, presumably resulting in the deaths of multiple D-Class personnel, knowing the Foundation's preferred testing protocols. Ever since, SCP-7026-1 and SCP-7026-2 have been contained in separate glass containers, within separate storage lockers at Site-64. Needless to say, these shoes aren't likely going to be worn or thrown anytime soon. That's right, it's that time again. We're recalibrating, rebooting, and hitting restart on our infamous Anomatron 6000, the specialized supercomputer we've developed to simulate improbable scenarios between the SCP Foundation's various anomalies and any other characters from any other universe you could possibly imagine. On today's agenda, what do you think would happen if John Wick, the notorious hitman, highly trained in all forms of combat, was up against an enemy that won't go down in a single shot, an undead menace known as SCP-008? Well, we're about to hit the button and find out. Either by a pure, unpredictable instance of human error, or through the act of some twisted karmic fate, the SCP Foundation had an outbreak on their hands. A sample of the complex prion, a virus known as SCP-008, had leaked. The Foundation had hoped to keep the existence of the disease highly classified, even among its own personnel. Their fear had been that some hostile force would attempt to synthesize or even weaponize SCP-008. After all, the disease had a 100% rate of both infection and lethality. It killed anything it came into contact with, or at least, it killed them to begin with. Before long, everyone in the Foundation facility that had been exposed to the leaking sample of SCP-008's already infected victims was dead. Flu-like symptoms were followed swiftly by a coma. However, the disease hijacked the bodies of all those it had passed to, reactivating the motor functions of their corpses and turning them into, well, you can already guess. No one was safe. Even the mobile task force on the scene were soon infected with SCP-008. They had been a squad of rookies and fresh-faced new recruits, sent in by the Foundation under the assumption that an outbreak of this sort should have been easy to contain. It wasn't. The entire facility was soon overrun. The bodies of Foundation researchers, security officers, and MTF troops reanimated after their deaths, now jostling around in search of survivors to pass SCP-008 onto. That should hold them! Dr. Alto Clef yelled, locking the entrance to the watchtower tight. Uh, this really is another fine mess, Clef. His colleague, Dr. Gears, replied in frustration. Our MTF backup are all down. We could be the last two people on site and we're locked in a tower with only one entry? Tell me, what the hell are we supposed to do now? Ah, oh, well, you'll relax, Clef insisted. Don't worry, there's someone we can call to get us out of this jam. Oh, don't say I know a guy. Gears sighed as his fellow researcher gave a wide grin and reached for his cell phone. A few moments later, and only a matter of miles away, another phone started ringing. Its owner, a man in a dark all-black tailored suit with a shadowy shirt and tie to match, reached into his pocket and lifted his cell phone to his ear. Good evening. I apologize for calling you at this hour, came the unmistakable voice of Sharon, the concierge of the New York Continental Hotel. That's quite all right, replied the suited man. We received a call asking for your whereabouts, sir. A job? The man asked in a monotone voice. Indeed, Sharon replied. Up front? I'm afraid not. The hotel's receptionist answered sympathetically. The contract is only in exchange for payment upon completion. The man who made the call was very insistent. He said he will be in no position to pay until the job is done. But he asked for you specifically and told us he'd be grateful for your assistance. The man on the end of the line sighed. Where? Oh, don't worry, sir. The friendly concierge replied. 
we're sending a car for you. At that precise moment, a yellow New York cab pulled up to the sidewalk. Best of luck, Mr. Wick, Sharon said before hanging up the call. Straightening his suit, the infamous hitman John Wick climbed into the back of the taxi as it sped off towards its destination. Arriving at a complex upstate, far off the beaten track, John examined his surroundings while the car inched closer to the nearest part of the facility. His years of training as an assassin under the tutelage of Roskroma had given him an instinctive spatial awareness, one that came in handy in his line of work. But even then, John couldn't have predicted that something would come leaping down from above, crashing through the cab's windshield. The car's hood buckled under the impact, fragments of glass spraying everywhere as an arm cracked the front window. The thing snarled and gurgled like a wild animal as it reached for the taxi driver, gripping his arm. It pulled him by the wrist, biting down, causing him to scream in intense pain. Meanwhile, John had already moved with lightning-fast reflexes and sprung out of the back seat. He hadn't had a chance to assess the threat. His instincts told him his best option was to put some distance between himself and whatever had just attacked the car. Then he'd be able to get a better idea what he was dealing with. The job description he'd been hired for had been light on details. John's mystery employer only referred to it as a, quote, cleanup operation. Sprinting towards the facility, John slammed the door behind him. He pulled off his belt from around his waist and wrapped it tightly around the door handles. It would hold for now. It was only when he turned around that he saw a few clustered groups of figures shuffling around inside the building's atrium. The nearest gaggle were close enough that it was easy for John to make out their pale skin, sunken eyes and cheeks, the unnatural twitches and erratic movements they were making as the creatures turned to look back at him. Zombies, John Wick muttered under his breath. That's unexpected. The nearby trio of SCP-008 infectees looked like they were about to make a dash towards him, so John moved fast. He raced towards a nearby corridor, hearing that the three zombies were already chasing after him. Their shambling footsteps had quickly become an animalistic charge, their limbs only able to move after death thanks to the virus that they were infected with. Turning a corner, John Wick took cover, his shoulder pressed to the wall. He drew his pistol from its holster underneath his suit jacket and stood in a battle-ready stance. The second he saw one of the zombie's faces appear around the corner, he raised his weapon and fired, swooping around one of his hiding places to fire another two shots. All three hit center mass right through their chests. The noise would no doubt have drawn the attention of the other SCP-008s in the building, but for now the three that had been on his tail dropped to the floor, only to start getting back up again. John wasn't used to his targets standing to their feet after he'd already fired at them, and the nearest of the zombies staggered back to his level. He lifted his firearm again. Before his finger could compress enough force on the trigger, though, the undead abomination took a wild, flailing swipe at him. The SCP-008 instance knocked the weapon out of John's hand, causing it to clatter to the ground, while it reared back its other arm for a second strike. Catching the blow, John Wick displayed his incredible reflexes and mastery of martial arts. He delivered a series of precise punches and chops, deploying a combination of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Aikido, and Krav Maga to try and knock the snarling monster down. With each hit, he was careful to avoid the zombie's mouth, having seen one bite the cab driver earlier. John had assessed that SCP-008 could be transmitted through biting, and he was correct. Exposure to mucous membranes or bodily fluids of an infected individual was what allowed the virus to spread. One of the other SCP-008 zombies that were still in the process of climbing back up swiped John's legs out from underneath him. The master assassin toppled over, landing on his back with the weight of the first monster still on top of him, while the second clawed at his tapered suit pants. Seconds before it could snap its teeth down on his ankle, John pulled back his leg and shot it back out in a devastating bicycle kick that sent the second zombie reeling into the third, which was still trying to get back up after its earlier gunshot. But the first of the creatures were still bearing down on him. Mustering as much of his peak physical strength as he needed, John Wick held the zombie at bay, blocking it with one arm, stopping it from getting close enough to bite him. His eyes darted around, looking for something, anything he could use. That was one of John's most enviable and impressive skills, one that made him so renowned as a legend of the assassin world. In the hands of John Wick, any ordinary, everyday object could be a lethal weapon. Reaching out with this other hand, John felt his fingertips brush against something metal. It was so close, just out of reach. 
On top of him, the zombie flailed its arms, trying to claw at him. Lifting both legs in a fluid, balletic motion, John Wick kicked the creature off of him, crawling towards the nearby object and grabbing it, just as the zombie started to approach again. With the swing and a loud metallic clang, the heavy fire extinguisher collided with the SCP-008 infectee's head. The force of the blow caused it to drop in an instant, landing in a heap on the floor. John waited a second to see if it would get back up again, but it was still. The other two zombies suddenly dashed towards the infamous hitman, only for their prey to duck and weave effortlessly between their aggressive clawing swipes, bashing his makeshift weapon against their heads like a battering ram against a door. All three were down, but the entire facility was still crawling with a mass of the reanimated monstrosities. Calmly, John smoothed his suit and straightened up his shirt and tie, walking with the fire extinguisher in hand, back down the corridor towards the sound of more SCP-008 zombies snarling. They were next. The Baba Yaga would use anything he found to take down each and every one of them, until not one was left standing. It didn't matter if all he had was a fire extinguisher, or one of the fallen security officer's batons, or even just a tiny pencil. Nothing would make it out of that facility alive. He just had to go for the head. Still trapped in the watchtower, Dr. Clef and Dr. Gears had long since grown irritated with each other's company. They had no security feeds, no way of knowing what was going on within the overrun Foundation facility. For a while, the pair of researchers had been toying with the idea of climbing out of a window and scaling down the side of the tower, but giving up on that plan when they'd realized they'd only be dropping back into a horde of SCP-008 zombies. A sudden explosion erupted from one corner of the complex, causing Gears and Clef to direct their attention towards it. From their elevation, they could see the ground below was littered with the bodies of the SCP-008 infectees, rendered lifeless once again by significant cranial trauma. In short, something had been bashing the zombies in the head. Or someone. The sound of a banging against the locked watchtower door startled both Foundation scientists. Instantly, they thought that the zombies had made their way up the steps and found the two researchers, easy prey, trapped in a cage. The heavy thud against the metal door repeated, then there was a pause, deafening tense silence filling the room. A polite knock came from the other side of the watchtower entrance. Cautiously, Clef approached to unlock it. Standing in the doorway as it opened was a single figure, panting with exhaustion but still nowhere near beaten. He looked out at Clef and Gears from his dark hair, a stern expression on his face. Neither one of the researchers could believe that he was still alive, still uninfected, but then again, he was the one and only John Wick, the Baba Yaga. When you work for the SCP Foundation, one certainty is that nothing, no turn of events, no scenario, is ever really unexpected. No matter how unlikely something may appear, chances are it usually happens. And if it doesn't happen here, then in an infinite multiverse of alternatives, everything that can possibly happen is statistically likely to. We've covered a few of these alternate eventualities before, a number of which revolve around the differing events in the long life of one particular anomaly, SCP-076-2, better known as Abel. In our home universe, much like he is in many others, Abel is considered to be a near-perfect warrior. His body, covered in tattoos of occult symbols and demonic faces, is capable of withstanding vast amounts of physical damage. Abel can easily take hits from the most powerful conventional weapons mankind has to offer, and survive with little more than a scratch. What's more, he can draw an endless supply of black-bladed weapons from a tiny pocket dimension. And on top of all of that, even in the event that he's bested in combat, Abel's body will rapidly disintegrate, only to reform within a large stone cube known as SCP-076-1. Like most of us, Abel has a number of almost identical counterparts that exist across the various worlds of the multiverse. One of them once had the opportunity to reconcile with his brother Cain, the man seemingly responsible for Abel's endless life of bloodshed. And once the two brothers had made peace, they could rest. In another universe, Abel worked directly with the SCP Foundation as part of a mobile task force until they turned on him. 
This unfurled a chain of events so cataclysmic that the entire world suffered the consequences. This alternate Abel went on a warpath against the Foundation, ultimately using SCP-914 The Clockworks to refine his destructive, anomalous abilities. This allowed him to unleash chaos, slaughtering all of humanity in an omnicide that wiped the world clean of all other life, leaving Abel alone in a dead world. And then there was this version of the Immortal Warrior. Far from the Clockworks Enhanced Conqueror that his alternate universe counterpart was, this Abel had long since been removed as a member of MTF Omega-7 and was gradually reconstituting his body within SCP-076-1. His most recent defeat had enraged the warrior, and he had vowed to once again be free. Although unbeknownst to him, what set this particular version of Abel apart from his other variants was the fact that he would soon encounter a certain other anomaly, something that when wielded by SCP-076-2 had the potential to completely rob him of all his centuries worth of fighting ability and replace it with an embarrassment that would last for centuries more. But first, a quick history lesson. Much like it had been in our universe, this particular anomalous object had been recovered by the Foundation after it made its way into the hands of an unwitting police officer. The item in question was SCP-572, a particularly unique katana, unique in that it was utterly useless for fighting with and caused more harm to the person wielding it than whoever they were trying to use it against. In this universe, the sword had already changed hands a number of times. When police were called to the home of one Clarence Clancy Clancerson, he drew SCP-572 in defense and screamed at the officers that he would, quote, take their heads and with it their power. The cops who had been sent over to arrest Clancy for violent and disorderly behavior were less than threatened to see their suspect, who was somewhat out of shape, coming at them with a weapon no sharper than a butter knife. After pacifying Clancy with tasers and bean bag rounds from a 12-gauge shotgun, the police retrieved SCP-572, and then it was acquired by a Foundation operative. This all played out almost the exact same way in our universe. However, in this version of events, there was one key difference. As previously mentioned, SCP-572 was an unremarkable sword, but it had something of a storied past, passing from one unfortunate user to the next. And just as it was recovered from Clancy's house and ended up in Foundation hands, one of those former owners had just been about to reclaim the fabled weapon for himself. Meanwhile, back in this containment chamber, deep under the ocean, still trapped in the stone cube he reanimated within, Abel was lost in a dream. To any other person, falling asleep to see subconscious visions of so much carnage would be horrifying. They would call it a nightmare. But to Abel, this might have been one of the sweetest dreams that he had ever experienced. All around him was a world on fire, having returned to life once again. Abel at last bested his captors at the SCP Foundation. In his dream, he traveled the world, visiting every Foundation facility one by one and reducing them to rubble without leaving a single survivor. Then, once the work was done, he turned his barbaricism towards the wider world and began slaughtering humanity in droves. Perhaps some distant cosmic echo had reached out across the multiverse. A fragment of the life of a more refined version of himself had slipped into Abel's subconsciousness, making him dream that he, too, was the omnicidal conqueror that his other self was. Seeing such devastation in his own wake made this version of Abel eager to wake up, to revive once more, and set about making this delightful dream of destruction a deadly reality. It was while Abel was dreaming, picturing himself cutting down all who dared oppose him, that something strange seemed to happen. He had a visitor, not a visitor to his containment chamber, mind you. There was no one beyond the confines of SCP-076-1 except the security team that normally kept the stone cube under armed surveillance. No, this visitor appeared somewhere else, inside Abel's mind, approaching him as he slept. Within the warrior's slumbering fantasy, he was climbing up a mountain of skulls after having slaughtered millions, if not billions, already. But as he reached the top of the pile of bones and looked out over the horizon, Abel could see that the world beyond was still living. There were just as many people alive, perhaps even more that he'd already killed. His work was not yet done. In fact, it seemed that despite all the lives the immortal madman had already claimed, 
He had barely even begun. Oh, Abel, a voice tutted. Did you really think you could do it alone? Even though this was a dream, Abel could feel the presence of another. He pulled one of his obsidian-edged weapons from thin air and swiped in the direction the voice had come from, hitting nothing. The blade in his hand seemed to change, its dark metal transforming from solid to liquid. Coming apart in his hands, Abel's sword melted like candle wax under a hot flame, reduced to nothing in seconds. You can't do it, the voice whispered. You aren't strong enough, but I can help with that. Pulling out another weapon, a two-handed axe this time, Abel looked around him, trying to locate the source of the taunting noise. Only a coward relies on cheap tricks and illusions, he growled angrily. Show yourself! Come forward and be slain! Are you a worthy opponent? Are you worth your time? Are you? The voice jested. We shall see! Abel yelled. Behind him, a cloaked figure silently appeared. They looked to be adorned in a robe that whipped in the biting cold wind, yet their garments weren't made of any fabric. Instead, they wore a robe made out of pure shadow, their clothes and body comprised of the same thing. Though they lacked any tangible solid matter, it didn't stop Abel from spinning around, swinging his heavy axe in the figure's direction. Before the blade of the weapon was even halfway through the air, it had already started to become liquid, just like the swords had earlier. By the time it came down to strike at the shadowy visitor, what had once been an axe was just a flick of melted black metal, passing through the intangible specter as Abel found himself once again unarmed. Speak, Creighton, he demanded, never one to back away from a fight, even when his weapons were seemingly failing him. Tell me who you are. I would like to know my adversary's name before I end your worthless life. I am not here to fight you, the figure replied calmly. I'm here to offer you the key to your victory, Abel. What key? The warrior sneered. What could you possibly give me? Exactly what you need to finish it, the shadow replied, drawing something from a sheath on its belt and holding it aloft. A weapon that will allow you to become the conqueror you long to be. Abel looked at the object in the figure's outstretched hand, a katana, or at least the shadowy vestige of one. A sword? He sneered. What use do I have for a sword? I can conjure all the blades I need at will. To demonstrate, Abel pulled one of his own black blades, but yet again it began to melt away. Your weapons have served you well, but they are disposable, the shadow explained. A true warrior deserves a sword worthy of his fighting prowess. I have killed scores of men throughout the ages, the immortal warrior retorted. And I never needed any special sword to do that. And that is why, no matter how many you kill, you will always be beaten. In his dream, Abel paused a moment, looking at the katana and considering. Then he reached his hand out to grip the shadowy hilt. In that same split second, SCP-076-2 awoke once again from his slumber and broke free of the stone cube encasing him. As he killed his way through the Foundation personnel in the facility housing SCP-076-1, Abel had only one thought in his mind. He needed that sword. You see, what the immortal maniac was unfortunately totally unaware of was the interesting effect SCP-572 could have on people. As well as being a totally useless sword, anyone who picked it up will instantly believe the katana of apparent invincibility to be an all-powerful weapon of ancient legend. Despite the sword being crudely made, blunt, and generally unfit for any use, the wielder will maintain the belief that it not only has perfect balance and cutting power, but that the sword has also imbued them with unparalleled strength and invincibility to damage. And now, either through the sword itself extending this cognito-hazardous influence into Abel's dream, or by the interference of some unknown trickery, one of the most dangerous anomalous killers in the world was making a beeline straight for SCP-572. And he wasn't the only one either. At a previous point in time, a man by the name of Zack had purchased SCP-572 on eBay, but it was far more than just an oddity to him. He wasn't looking to start a sword collection. As a child, he had been obsessed with comic book superheroes, and when Zack bought that katana, he intended to use the blade to dispense vigilante justice against those who preyed on the innocent. And even before he held it in his hands, Zack too felt the anomalous pull of the katana 
knowing in his heart it was the perfect weapon to transform him into a hero. Of course, he had quickly been disproven, when on his first night of crime fighting, Zack had been hit by a mid-sized sedan in a multi-story parking lot and suffered a concussion. Sent to the hospital and then charged with attempted assault, Zack had long since lost any and all interest in ever donning his costume, comprised of hockey pads and a ski mask, or picking up the sword ever again. But as time had gone on, that old familiar pull had started to gnaw at Zack, urging him to get back in the superhero game, forgetting how poorly that had worked out for him last time. One problem still stood in his way, though. He needed his trusty sword back. Of course, in the time since he'd hung up his hero outfit, Clancy had gotten his hands on SCP-572, and then right before Zack could steal it back, the Foundation had taken it. It had taken him months of preparation. He'd sneakily made dealings with a janitor that worked at one of the Foundation sites. Zack had bribed the man a lot of money in exchange for his keycard and uniform, even having to take out a second mortgage on his apartment to meet the frankly extortionate amount the janitor asked for. But it would be worth the cost, Zack told himself. If it reunited him with his trusty katana, then it would be worth it. Only then would he once again be a full hero. Shuffling through the facility, Zack dragged a mop over the floor, leaving a sign to warn the slippery hazard. He whistled to himself, trying to act as casually as possible, not realizing that he was slightly overselling it. Once he was certain the coast was clear, he made his move. SCP-572 was locked in a secure deposit box within Site-19's high-value item storage facility, right where he had been cleaning. He began searching through the various anomalous oddities kept there, until he saw it. The box containing his coveted sword. All his effort in infiltrating the Foundation had finally paid off. It was all leading to this, his comeback in crime fighting. It was at this precise moment that Abel came bursting through a nearby door. Completely befuddled, Zack quickly found himself thrown to one side by the much stronger man. Out of my way, weakling, Abel roared before turning to face the deposit box holding SCP-572. Gripping the box, Abel used his superhuman strength to tear it open, as though the container was made from cardboard. There it was. Stored safely within was the weapon he had been seeking, the same all-powerful sword from his vision. At last, he declared, reaching for the hilt. The sword belongs to me. The second that Abel hoisted it into the air, he felt a human weight dash towards him, only to shrug it off as it made impact. Zack tumbled to the floor, winded as Abel barely flinched at the attempted tackle. You fool, he roared. You dare come at me? You'll be the first to fall to my new blade, the first of this pathetic world of unworthy opponents to die in my conquest. Zack frighteningly raised his arms in an attempt to shield himself, when Abel raised the sword menacingly above his head. The mortal man knew what the sword was capable of, or so he thought, as Abel brought the blade swiping downwards. Its true ineffectiveness as a melee weapon was on full display. SCP-572's dull, poorly balanced blade barely grazed Zack's arms as he protected his face. In fact, beyond the initial swat, it barely hurt. Uh, I, I don't understand. Abel stammered, looking at the katana in confusion. This is meant to be a warrior blade, a weapon of champions and conquerors. Y yeah, that's what I was thinking, Zack replied, also suffering from SCP-572's cognitohazardous effect. He'd fully expected to die a second ago, slain by the very weapon he had been hoping to reclaim. Uh, still, maybe it's just because it's your first go? I, I could show you how to- Silence! I will not fall for that, Abel interrupted. Let me see here, maybe the angle was off? Or how about I use both hands here, let me just… Once again, Abel hoisted the weapon, this time with both hands tightly gripping the blade, intending to bring it slashing down in a big swing like a woodsman cleaving a log in two. Unfortunately, as he raised the sword, the blade caught an exposed light fixture above. Sparks burst from the ceiling as an electrical current shot through the metal and gave Abel a nasty shock. Oh God, what is the meaning of this? He shouted in frustration. I've been alive for centuries, killed thousands upon thousands of men since the dawn of civilization! Why can't I use this sword? Well, performance issues for a guy your age? Eh, hardly an uncommon problem, Zack joked. Both turned at the sound of a door kicked open, the clomp of heavy boots on the ground as a Foundation security team burst in. SCP-076-2, drop your weapons and- The commander stopped mid-shout. Wait, that's not one of his regular swords, is it? Sir, um, <clears throat> that's, uh... 
One of the officers paused inside. I think that's SCP-572. Attack me! Abel yelled at the Foundation officers, pointing the dull tip of the katana at them. If you dare, for now I wield the greatest blade known to the universe. You will all fall in a single stroke of my new weapon. And once you have fallen, so shall the world! SCP-076-2. Abel, look, just put the thing down. The commander urged. Uh, trust me, you'll, you'll thank yourself. <laughs> you pathetic fools are so afraid of the chaos I will unleash. The warrior declared. Such unworthy opponents! Okay, I've seen enough. The security commander sighed. Deadly force authorized. Light them up, boys! On the commander's signal, a hail of gunfire erupted. Bullets raining down on Abel. He slashed SCP-572 through the air, certain that what he thought was a mighty sword could easily cut through the oncoming bullets. Of course, that may have been true, if SCP-572's only real power was not having any power at all. Each shot struck Abel's center mass, barely damaging him given his body's natural resilience to harm, particularly from such small arms fire. Although, he didn't find it any less annoying that he couldn't seem to properly wield his new katana. Oh, are you kidding me? He huffed to himself. What is with me today? Can't get the hang of this thing. Come on, Abel, but still a sword. The weapon that will allow me to conquer this whole world, but if I can just get the swing right! Calmly knowing that the weapon itself posed no threat, even in the hands of an immortal mass murderer, the security team moved in to apprehend Abel. Before they could take the katana from his hands, he dashed towards them, swiping the sword back and forth, hoping to at least hit someone to get the ball rolling on his omnicidal rampage. Instead, thanks to the influence of SCP-572, he miscalculated, took a wrong step, and slipped over on a patch of freshly mopped tile, landing in a heap next to a wet floor sign. The security team all winced, feeling the second-hand embarrassment practically radiating off of Abel as the ancient anomalous warrior lay on the floor after a spectacular fall. Then, one by one, they all burst out into uncontrollable fits of laughter. But while they were distracted, they were completely oblivious to Zack, who emerged from his hiding place and picked SCP-572 up off the floor. He breathed a sigh of relief, reunited with his prized weapon, having forgotten the severe injury it caused him last time. You, Abel wheezed, still lying in a puddle of mop water. Who are you? Zack gave a slight smile, unzipping the janitor's overalls he had on to reveal a set of hockey pads underneath. He slipped a ski mask over his face before turning back to Abel and replying in his most epic voice, I'm Captain Katana. Unfortunately, his return to crime fighting would be as short-lived as Abel's own turn with SCP-572. As Captain Katana found himself hit by a bus on his way home after trying to use the katana of apparent invincibility to cut said bus in half down the middle and failing in a rather painful fashion. SCP-096, the Shy Guy, woke up in an unfamiliar room without a thought in its head. However, one thing quickly occurred to it. This was not its containment chamber. No, the solid steel cube that had kept it locked up for decades now didn't have a front desk or walls covered in strange childlike murals or tinny party music playing over old speakers. Wherever SCP-096 had found itself, it certainly wasn't the place it had come to call home. If it could read, it would have registered the words behind the front desk, painted onto the wall, Ban Ban's Kindergarten, where joy comes alive. Little did 096 know, something really did come to life here at Ban Ban's Kindergarten, but it definitely wasn't joy. SCP-096 was typically used to a much more confined space, so presented with so much strange freedom, its natural instinct was to wander around, whimpering quietly to itself. This place was certainly peculiar, with multiple large reinforced doors, each one having a large red button fixed to the wall above them. A strange green creature was painted on the wall, with an affixed speech bubble that read, Jumbo Josh says, Eat fruits and vegetables if you want to be strong like me. Though 096 paid no mind to such things. This place looked like an SCP Foundation containment facility, mixed with an off-brand Chuck E. Cheese. And some tiny part of the Shy Guy's dim and dismal brain wanted to see more of it. What other secrets could it hold? The Shy Guy pressed one of the big red buttons, causing the doors to open underneath it. 
There was a faint sound of childish laughter somewhere down the distant hall. How had it ever found its way into such a strange place? The deeper the shy guy wandered, the more strange murals it saw on the wall. There was one for a large orange cartoon jellyfish with one staring eye, where the speech bubble read, Stinger Flynn says, Having many arms allows me to help a lot of people. Then, a squat blue gorilla-like creature with sharp lower teeth had a speech bubble that read, Captain Fiddles says, Ooga Booga, Booga Ooga. A white feminine cat-like creature had the speech bubble, Bambolina says, Kindness is free, so sprinkle it everywhere. A misshapen pink bird creature had the speech bubble, Opila Bird says, Laughter is the best medicine, so make sure to smile. And of course, most importantly of all, presiding over the creativity room was a mural of a grinning red creature wearing a pair of party hats on its head like horns. His speech bubble read, Ban Ban says, sharing is caring, your pancreas is mine. A whiteboard not far from this mural had the words, run for your lives, hastily scrawled onto it. To anyone but the shy guy who had no point of reference, this was clearly not a normal kindergarten. As the shy guy passed into the hallway, slowly lumbering along, it suddenly felt an intense spike of burning pain right through its forehead. Rising like a fever pitch, the shy guy's subdued whimpers quickly escalated into horrifying wails of animalistic rage. This could only mean one thing. Somewhere, something had made the terrible mistake of gazing at the shy guy's face. In fact, not ten feet away, the unfortunate Opala bird had made that very mistake. It typically peeked out from behind one of the hallway's pillars to get a good look at any potential intruders or new prey wandering into its midst. But this time, the beastly bird's curiosity had taken it from predator to prey itself, though it wouldn't realize this until it was already too late. As the mutant bird creature skittered back into the cavernous hall filled with plastic trees and an underwhelming play area, the shy guy came galloping after it on all fours, roaring with fury. The Opala bird was shocked to see the creature giving chase. This doesn't make sense. I'm meant to chase you. You're not meant to chase me. But things are rarely fair when it comes to the shy guy. Arguably one of the most dangerous Euclid-class creatures ever kept in Foundation containment. The Opala bird flapped desperately towards the boarded-up escape hatch, but the shy guy was so much faster. It grabbed hold of the bird gripping it in its iron clutches and began to stretch open its bottom jaw with a blood-curdling roar. We'll spare you the details of what happened next, but suffice to say, little more than a handful of feathers were left. After finishing off the Opala bird, the shy guy reverted from rage back to pitiful sadness. This place was no better than the SCP Foundation. There were still creatures here to look at its face and drive it into a state of extreme emotional distress. It was horrible. The shy guy needed to find a way to hide himself away again, so he decided to tear away the planks covering up the escape hatch and lope down the narrow hall. In there, the shy guy actually found something to its liking. Two platforms, one on either side of the room, with what seemed to be a deep, dark chasm between the two. For most, there was an electrical lift system for carrying them between the platforms, but the shy guy had no interest in the platforms. He only sought the darkness below, where nobody could see his face. That would suit him just fine. The shy guy jumped over the guardrail and plummeted down below into the dark. Feeling the air against its cold gray skin as it fell felt wonderful. It dared to think that it might even find solace in this deep, dark place but as soon as he hit something solid, some kind of metal lift system, alarms went off, and flashing red lights soon made everything down there in the darkness visible. To be exposed like this while it thought it was hidden was the dreaded Shy Guy's worst nightmare. Little did he know, he would soon become the worst nightmare of a number of other beasts. As the Shy Guy crawled off the metal platform, hoping that perhaps it could find another place to hide down here. Its hands and feet splashed into shallow water. Had something sprung a leak down here? The shy guy began wandering the half-dark as the water of this flooded sub-basement area pooled around him. It had no idea that another creature was already sneaking up behind it, getting ready to strike. Before 096 could even react, 
Several whip-like orange tentacles wrapped around its limbs and began delivering an antagonizing shock through its body. More tentacles came in soon after, wrapping around the shy guy's body and face, delivering shock after shock after shock with its millions of tiny, venomous stinger barbs. For a second, it seemed like the surprise attack might actually be able to subdue the monster, but little did the Shy Guy's attacker, the monstrous real Stinger Flynn, know that attacking it was just another way to activate its infamous rage state. The second that Stinger Flynn relented, even just for a moment, the Shy Guy grabbed him by the tentacles and slammed him into the watery floor, again and again and again, until the grip of his tentacles loosened around the Shy Guy's body and he was defenseless. With Stinger panicked and immobilized, the Shy Guy released the full force of his supernatural fury, striking the demonic jellyfish with his fists until what was left couldn't be distinguished from the water it used to be floating in. Stinger Flynn had been completely annihilated. The Shy Guy once again temporarily returned to a state of calm and wandered out of this watery basement into a nearby hallway where everything was bright and dry. The walls were painted in garish, childlike drawings of a jungle with janky-looking animals. The Shy Guy paid no mind to any of it. All he wanted was to find somewhere that he could actually be alone, and away from prying eyes of all these freaks. This dream was short-lived, because as soon as the Shy Guy found a new room, a wide-open auditorium filled with inflatable jungle trees, like a crude play area, he was being stalked yet again. A powerful, muscular predator, with veins stretching over its bulging muscles and blue skin. It knew that this intruder had already killed two of its fellow garden dwellers, but this time, it would put this spindly, pale stranger in its place. The Shy Guy heard something rumbling towards it from behind, and turned upon hearing the blood-curdling war cry of Ooga Booga Booga Ooga. It was the gorilla-like Captain Fiddles, with strands of saliva hanging from his tusks. He leaped onto the Shy Guy and began pounding into its hideous face with his huge blue fists. Captain Fiddles would destroy the Shy Guy, pound him into the concrete until he stopped moving. The one thing that Captain Fiddles didn't expect was for the Shy Guy to start fighting back. And he was about to learn the hard truth that the Shy Guy could fight a lot harder than him. The SCP's spindly but immensely powerful arms grabbed Captain Fiddles by the shoulders and threw him into the wall, causing huge cracks to crawl up towards the ceiling. Before Captain Fiddles could even think about wrenching himself free, the Shy Guy leaped to his feet and bounded over to him. The Shy Guy grabbed Captain Fiddles by the ankles and ripped him out of the wall, letting his body drop to the floor and then unleashing hell upon him. Captain Fiddles would have begged for mercy if he wasn't already dead. Before the Shy Guy could even begin to calm down, a trapdoor opened in the floor beneath him, dropping him into a new area, a multicolored maze where 096 was trapped like a helpless rat, with the body count of an atomic bomb. Once again, the Shy Guy didn't need to go looking for trouble, because trouble was already on its way. The pure white, cat-like Bambolina pounced from a sharp corner in the maze, claws bared. She jumped onto the Shy Guy, latching onto him and clawing, trying to scratch his nightmare of a face. If the Shy Guy had ever possessed anything resembling patience, it would have run out long before now. He grabbed Bambolina, shrugging off the pain of her claws and tossing her into the darkness high above. She flew off with a cat-like yell and hit some distant ceiling with a crunch. Suffice to say, she wouldn't be back to bother the Shy Guy again. Tired and angry, the pale abomination didn't feel like wandering through a maze. Instead, it just charged straight through, destroying colorful wall after colorful wall. When it encountered whatever was behind this extremely frustrating afternoon, it would destroy it with extreme prejudice. That was almost certainty. After breaking through one more wall, the Shy Guy tumbled out into a strange room where a grinning red creature was waiting for him. Wearing two party hats on top of his head, this was no mere lackey. It was Ban Ban himself, the one behind this nightmarish kindergarten. He stared right into the Shy Guy's face with no fear at all, almost like he knew something that the Shy Guy didn't. And it was true, he had no plan to fight the Shy Guy himself. He'd brought a champion with him. As the Shy Guy started to scream in rage, all the boxes behind Ban Ban tumbled out of the way as a huge figure rose. A behemoth at least 50 feet tall, with green skin, giant teeth, 
and huge staring eyes. It was Jumbo Josh, and if the Shy Guy wanted to graduate from this nightmare kindergarten, it would need to defeat him and Ban Ban. The Shy Guy growled, digging its claws into the ground and preparing to charge forward. Challenge accepted. Uh, what about this one? One SCP researcher called to the other. You've gotta be kidding. His colleague scoffed, interpreting the suggestion as little more than a joke. That thing's a piece of junk. She tapped a knuckle against the glass case, catching the attention of the tiny figure inside. Who dares? exclaimed the tinny, monotone voice. Release me from this irksome confinement so that I may bring about your final undoing, vermin, for I am Doomba 2000, the ultimate bringer of destruction. Both researchers laughed at the small automaton inside the glass. They had come to SCP Item Gallery 27 in search of non-organic anomalies to gather for testing. But judging by their reactions, it seemed that SCP-1370 wasn't going to make the cut. The cobbled together robot was widely considered to be a harmless, clumsy little oddity, rather than any kind of threat. But that didn't stop SCP-1370 from challenging any and all things around it to a battle to the death. Battles it always lost. Ah, this thing is junk, the second researcher remarked, flicking her finger at the glass again in an attempt to startle the robot. It is not organic, though, the other pointed out, observing that SCP-1370 had been constructed out of various recycled parts. Its head was a defunct and non-operational voltmeter, soldered awkwardly onto a weak neck joint. Its arms were wrenches, and it had been configured in such a way that gave the robot a top-heavy, impractical design. Inorganic, yes, but worth our time? Definitely not. Come on, we'll find something else to test in SCP-914. As the pair of researchers turned their backs on SCP-1370, it began to squawk at them again through the speaker embedded in its chest. You dare walk away from me? You have incurred the wrath of Robolord the Destructor and will soon be reduced to atoms by my hand! The tiny junk robot charged towards the two Foundation personnel, only to slam front first into the glass of the display case it was kept contained in. The force of the impact, combined with SCP-1370's imbalanced design, caused it to topple over and land on its back, leaving a huge crack in the glass. Ah, great. One of the researchers sighed, rolling her eyes. We're gonna have to report that SCP-1370's damaged its case again. Come on, let's go and get someone to replace that glass. You think we should just leave it here unsupervised in a damaged case? The other asked. Look at the thing, it's hardly competent enough to escape, the fellow researcher replied, as the tiny robot struggled to get itself back upright. I'm sure it'll be fine for a few minutes. Little did the pair of researchers realize as they left item gallery 27 that SCP-1370 had been listening to their conversation, picking up on a few details. While the anomalous automaton often displayed a low level of intelligence and awareness of its surroundings, it was still self-aware. And on top of that, harbored a hatred for all things it believed to be living. Although it could be easily tricked, and lacked any kind of real fighting ability, but it had picked up on something the researchers had mentioned, an SCP-914, perhaps through its own limited intelligence or some kind of other anomalous awareness, the tiny robot detected this to mean another machine. And so, standing back up, it struck the glass of its display case again, shattering one side completely. It hopped down to the ground, tumbling over thanks to its lack of balance, only to eventually stand back up and start making its way through the facility. Being only a meter tall made it easy for SCP-1370, otherwise known as Pesterbot, to sneak through the corridors of the Foundation site undetected. It eventually arrived at a room housing a large mass of gears and gyros, a machine filled with clockwork components that seemed to pull the little robot further in as it drew closer and closer to what the researchers had spoken of. SCP-914, the Clockworks, a device that could be used to refine any object placed inside it. Depending on the setting, items could be transformed, destroyed, or vastly improved using the Clockworks. Rough setting disintegrated any test subject, while coarse dismantled it to its base components. One-to-one -one replaced any item with an almost identical copy. Then, the fine setting would cause SCP-914 to improve any item, and very fine could refine an object to an even greater degree, usually by granting it anomalous properties. 
Testing of all biological matter within SCP-914 was strictly prohibited, but Pesterbot, well, he was made of metal. Sneaking into the room where the clockworks was located, SCP-1370 immediately caught sight of another Foundation researcher, who had been busy overseeing tests using the very fine setting of SCP-914. Instantly, the agitated little robot made a beeline for the researcher, swiping at her ankles with its wrench hands. Die! Die! It shrieked. Cower before the might of my claws! None can stand before the relentless destruction brought forth by Shivatron, despoiler of mirth! Referring to itself with one of its many elaborate self-appointed titles. Caught by surprise at the tiny robot, the researcher turned and screamed in surprise. Instinctively, she swung her leg back and brought it forward delivering a swift kick to SCP-1370 that sent its metal body hurtling through the air, right into the clockworks. Pesterbot landed inside the input booth, the enormous collection of clockwork components whirring and heaving as they sprung to life. The researcher hadn't even realized what was happening. She'd been addressing how much her foot hurt after kicking the small metal robot. By the time she looked up, SCP-914 had already fully activated with SCP-1370 inside. In horror, she sounded the alarm to summon security, with no idea what the very fine setting would do to improve Pesterbot. A team of guards filed into the room, drawing their weapons and training them on the output booth of the clockworks. While they normally would have nothing to fear from SCP-1370, given its inability to ever win in a fight that it started. Even when fighting a potted plant that had been affixed with a speaker, the tiny robot had been bested. But the clockwork's refinement process meant that what would be stepping out of the machine wouldn't be the pesterbot the Foundation was familiar with. Sure enough, the heavy foot that came stomping down on the facility floor was a far cry from the flimsy metal limbs SCP-1370 had previously had. Out of the clockworks emerged a hulking robotic form, not just bigger and bulkier than the meter-tall, clumsy assembled Pesterbot, but a huge, sleek machine built for bear. It was more humanoid, but stood at nearly seven feet tall. The weight and balance issues that had plagued the previous design were seemingly gone, as despite its increased size, this new and improved model of SCP-1370 seemed to move fluidly, with smooth electronic motions. The robot turned and assessed its surroundings, scanning the group of Foundation security that had amassed outside SCP-914, its first new targets. As the machine stepped towards them, the security commander gave the word, and the guards opened fire. A hail of gunfire rang out, deafening shots ringing in the security officer's ears as bullets spat out of their weapons towards the newly refined Pesterbot. By the time each of them had emptied their magazines and the smoke cleared, they realized to their terror that the robot was now bulletproof. You have engaged in an act of violence against Doom Master 1370, Master of All Doom. It announced in a new voice, one far deeper and more imposing than its previous tinny candor. Now it was a modulated electronic sound, far befitting its new look. Prepare to face consequences. Retaliating. With that, the robot leaped into battle with all the grace and ferocity of a wild cat. The nearest security guard barely had a chance to reload his weapon, raising his hands in a weak attempt at a block before the strike from a metallic fist knocked the wind out of him. Moving with balletic speed and precision, Pesterbot swiped and chopped at the guard, each hit connecting painfully with one of the man's vital pressure points, like it was a highly trained hand-to-hand -hand fighter. When the officer collapsed, unable to move save for letting out screams of excruciating pain, the robot turned to face its remaining targets. Freeze! One of the Foundation security yelled, raising his pistol with shaking hands. Zipping forwards, SCP-1370 grabbed the gun and wrenched it from the man's fingers, tearing the weapon apart like it was made of cardboard. Ripping the man by his SCP Foundation uniform, it launched him directly upwards, sending his body crashing through the ceiling, leaving a human-shaped hole above. Chunks of building materials rained down on the robot, including wiring and internal lengths of cable that ran through the walls and ceiling that were now exposed. As the security team retreated, SCP-1370 curiously reached up and gripped one of the electric cables, wrenching it out of the ceiling to examine it closer, causing sparks to shower. Pesterbot's new, sleek, metallic skin seemed to react to the metal in the wiring 
drawing out the copper that channeled electricity throughout the Foundation facility. It was more than a force of magnetism. It was something else. Ideas. SCP-1370 was learning, adapting, and most frightening of all, coming up with new ways to complete its purpose. Marching up to the nearest wall, it pulled back a metal fist and sent it slamming through paintwork and plaster to draw out the metal running through the building. Outside in the corridor, the lights died. In fact, the entire facility lost its power and plunged into darkness until the backup emergency lights activated, filling the Foundation's corridors with low-level blood-red light. More security officers had mobilized outside of the clockwork's room, expecting at any moment that the refined version of the previously harmless Pesterbot would soon appear. Sure enough, it did, and the red lighting was soon added to by yet another hail of frightening gunfire. But now, it seemed SCP-1370 had learned how to shoot back. An arc of lightning zapped through the corridor, electrifying every guard it touched and reducing them to little more than a smoldering husk. A second one followed, striking one guard with a bolt of blue electricity that then leaped from his body to the officer standing next to him, who had been close enough to touch his fallen comrade, and who was, of course, wearing plenty of conductive metal. The wiring in the walls, the electricity. SCP-1370 had learned how to weaponize it, and that wasn't all. As the robot stepped out of the room, it had pulled various other metalwork from the fabric of the building around it into its form, adding to its body in new and gruesome ways. Its shoulders now had additional armor. Long poles of rebar now extended out of its robotic forearms to act as crude, rudimentary impaling weapons. It had gotten even taller, and all forged out of metal it harvested from its surroundings. SCP-1370 hadn't just been made a better fighter, it had been given something else by SCP-914. Intelligence. The capacity for it to learn and perpetually adapt itself. And it wouldn't stop. It would keep improving itself to enact its original purpose. To fight anything and everything around it. A slaughter ensued. Everything the SCP Foundation threw at this new version of the Pesterbot only gave it more weapons and more offensive capabilities to add to its growing arsenal. The rebar weapons in its arms were replaced with sleek, sharp blades. Even bullets fired at it seemed to be absorbed into its mass, allowing it to keep growing. SCP-1370 was unstoppable, obliterating everyone that came to desperately try to contain it. And as it bested every opponent, left them decimated and defeated, something new happened to the robot. It couldn't feel emotions, just like with any automaton. It lacked the level of human cognition and complexity to respond to things with feelings. But as it killed more and more Foundation staff left and right, annihilating everything in its path, SCP-1370 experienced something. Not an emotion, but whatever the closest robotic equivalent to pure, unbridled happiness was. Satisfaction of the machine. Now able to complete the function it was originally built for, yet had failed at for so long. Getting bigger and bigger, adapting and adding more machines to itself, eventually SCP-1370 was a hulking behemoth. Cars and their combustion engines all became part of the robotic giant, every new piece of technology it encountered becoming a deadly weapon. And as Pesterbot started to tower over buildings, a huge-scale robotic threat, the Foundation had no choice. It was time to deploy another big bad bot to cut SCP-1370 back down to size. It was time to send in the Dragon Slayer. Burning neighborhoods, strings of horrific axe murders, a burger joint selling human flesh, and only one question. You mad bro? Fans of internet memes from the mid-2000s might remember one inescapable image commonly known as Trollface. Trollface and his trademark grin symbolized mischief and troublemaking, and generally making the world a more chaotic place. Over time, as is often the case on the internet, new variations on the image began to spring up as users created their own spin on Trollface. At first, it was all relatively harmless, but then again, this is the internet. Nothing online stays harmless forever. Over time, more sinister variations on Trollface began to surface, memes consisting of joke instructions that took a dark, destructive turn. 
This new spin on the troll face quickly became known as Trollja, and often featured disturbing content presented in a joking, prankster format. Still, not something to be too concerned about. Just standard edgy posting, trying to get a reaction by shocking people. Right? Not exactly. On December 24th, 2020, in Melbourne, Australia, a college student named Lee Miller received an early Christmas present from her classmate and ex-boyfriend, Peter Whitkins. The two had parted on relatively good terms, and she was glad to receive a gift from him. When she opened it, she was delighted to see that he had purchased her a jar of expensive French facial moisturizer, one she had been interested in trying back when they were together. As she prepared to do her skincare routine that night, she thought about how thoughtful the gift was and how sweet Peter was. Maybe she'd made a mistake breaking things off. Maybe after the holidays, she could reach out and see if they could give things another shot. As she unscrewed the jar of moisturizer, she didn't notice that its color and smell seemed just a bit off. She just dipped her fingers inside and began to apply the cream to her face. All of a sudden, she realized what a horrible mistake that was. Her face began to burn, her skin screaming out in a pain like none she'd ever felt before. She screamed, clawing at her face, desperate for a way to make it stop. Neighbors heard the screams and called emergency services. When paramedics arrived on the scene, her condition had gotten even worse. They restrained her, sedated her, and took her to the hospital for treatment. The face cream was brought in for testing and was found to have been tampered with. It had been spiked with Gimpy Gimpy, one of the world's most excruciatingly painful plants. Peter was promptly brought in for questioning, but refused to explain why he had done it. He was charged with assault, and officers inspected his home for anything that might suggest a motive. On his computer, they found the most recent post he had read before, presumably committing the crime. It was a Trollja meme, formatted as a comic, and it read, Wanna get back at your girlfriend? Step 1. Find out her favorite facial cream. Step 2. Procure the facial cream. Step 3. Obtain Utrecan plant. Use gloves. Step 4. Blend the leaves with the cream, then repack it. Step 5. Give girlfriend the gift. The meme contained a sixth step, but it was redacted in all official records for reasons that will soon become clear. This incident caught the attention of the SCP Foundation, who swiftly looked into the meme as a potential anomaly. As they were conducting their investigation, it happened again. Another Trojan meme, another horrible crime with an inexplicable motive. On December 28, 2020, in Banda Aka, Indonesia, 15 terminally ill patients were found dead in their hospital beds. That wouldn't necessarily be cause for alarm, given the nature of their conditions, except for the cause of death. The patients did not pass away due to their illnesses. Instead, each and every one of them was killed by carbon monoxide poisoning. At first, the case was a mystery, until security footage revealed that one of the hospital's orderlies, Aziz Hidiat, replaced the patient's oxygen tanks with tanks of carbon monoxide. He was promptly arrested and brought in for questioning. During the interrogation, he repeated again and again that he was not trying to harm the patients, but he was delivering them. The police officers asked who he was trying to deliver them to, but he refused to answer. A search through his computer browser history uncovered another Trollja meme. This one read, Want to help people? Step 1. Get a job at a hospital. Step 2. Make friends with the patients. Step 3. Enter oxygen tank room. Step 4. Replace tanks with carbon monoxide. Step 5. Release them from their defective vessels. The SCP Foundation had been in the process of formulating a hypothesis, but now it was confirmed. These variations on the Trollja meme contained a cognitohazardous switch that would cause a reader to carry out the acts described in the comic. The switch appeared to specifically be contained in the conclusive line, hence its removal from all official records of any identified anomalous memes. An estimated 0.25% of those exposed to an anomalous meme would be affected by this cognitohazard. The phenomenon was given the designation SCP-6661, and the memes themselves SCP-6661-1. These first two incidents were nicknamed the Pretty Girl Incident and the Sleepy Time Incident, respectively. Several other notable incidents occurred following the discovery of SCP-6661. On January 20th, 2021, the Harvester Valley Incident occurred. Oliver Desjardins of Alberta, Canada packed his bags full of camping supplies, fresh drinking water, a flashlight, and an axe. 
He kissed his wife and children goodbye, and he drove out to the local tourist campground. After darkness fell, he left his tent, axe in hand, and walked from camp to camp, slaughtering anyone he came across. He managed to kill 10 people and injure 14 before he was killed by the authorities. Everyone who knew Oliver was shocked, saying he had no history of violent behavior. He wouldn't even kill a spider when he found one inside. His wife gave the authorities permission to examine his internet activity, and sure enough, they found a trolljamin left open. Want to have a good holiday? Step 1. Pack necessary equipment and items. Step 2. Say goodbye to family. Step 3. Drive to the valley campgrounds. Step 4. Find local shepherd and his flock. Step 5. Steal a little lamb. Step 6. Relish upon its flesh for it will be your dying meal. Step 7. Data expunged. After reading the meme, the foundation determined that a nearby farmer was indeed missing one of his sheep. The bones of the missing sheep were later discovered near the campground where the attack took place. This new finding suggested that the cognitohazardous effects tended to result in a largely literal interpretation of the given meme's text. Oliver himself could not be questioned about his actions due to his death on the scene, so there were no more answers to be uncovered in his case. On February 16, 2021, in Bratislava, Slovakia, a man named Josef Prochaska began displaying unusual behavior at around 0200 hours. He drove through his neighborhood in his water truck and began using it to spray kerosene upon nearby buildings throughout the area. The sound and the smell woke several neighbors who attempted to reason with Joseph and make him stop what he was doing. He ignored them as if in a trance and carried on with his task. Frightened for their safety as well as that of their clearly unwell neighbor, they called emergency services to the scene. Emergency services arrived to find Joseph standing in front of the active nozzle, kerosene blasting directly onto him. He didn't even seem to notice. As the authorities approached him, calling out to him, asking him to come with them, he acknowledged their presence. He smiled broadly and pulled something from his pocket. All too late, they realized what it was, a road flare. He ignited it, and the area was swiftly engulfed in flames. 26 people were killed in the blast, and hundreds of thousands in property damage occurred as a result. That was shocking enough, but additional emergency responders who arrived at the scene saw something even more bizarre. It began to rain, putting out some of the flames. As the water touched the kerosene-soaked bodies and landscape, paramedics were completely taken aback as they saw corpses and bits of rubble begin to float up into the air up into the sky. One man later described what he had seen to the police, saying, It was as if they were floating on the water that was falling from the sky. The authorities dismissed this account, but the SCP Foundation knew better. This had to be another Trollja incident. Indeed, it was. And on Joseph's computer, they found the guilty meme. Oil is lighter than water. Step 1. Cover yourself in oil. Step 2. Feels good. Step 3. Cover others in oil. Step 4. Data expunged. Somehow this particular instance of SCP-6661 had managed to alter the laws of physics to bend them to its will. It was a troubling development and not something they cared to see repeated. Containment procedures were swiftly put into place. Web crawlers monitored the internet for any appearances of Trollja, particularly those that seemed to have cognitohazardous properties. If they could track these instances and delete them from circulation, perhaps they could prevent any more needless destruction. During the monitoring process, some of the web crawlers detected an instance of SCP-6661-1 with a heavily distorted concluding step. Before expunging this step, junior researcher Mikel Ramirez edited out the distortion and scanned the image through a spectrogram generator. This was, it should be noted, without prior authorization. The spectrogram generated audio three recognizable words. Junior researcher Ramirez was reprimanded for breaching protocol, but his work proved to be valuable enough to warrant additional research. With the sign-off of the O5 Council, a spectrogram was constructed with a reply to this question and spread through the internet. The Foundation's response was, Yes, we see you. Who are you? And why are you doing this? Within 24 hours of the Foundation's response, another SCP-6661-1 instance with a similar distortion was found. The distortion was isolated and scanned through a spectrogram generator once more. It stated,
This revelation gave the Foundation a new theory on the nature of SCP-6661. The initial Trollface meme was so popular, so widespread and beloved, that the collective energy directed towards it created a thought form able to manifest via the meme. When Trollface declined in popularity over the years, the thought form became desperate to achieve the same relevance again. It gravitated towards darker subject matter toward the shocking and disturbing in order to get attention. This resulted in the creation of SCP-6661-1, an opportunity for the thought form to feel seen again. When it does not feel seen, when it is not fed energy and attention, the thought form becomes weak and desperate. The cognitohazardous effects may not be deliberate at all, but rather an unfortunate side effect of this particular manifestation. An additional theory was proposed, the way to limit the effects of SCP-6661-1, to perhaps even eradicate it, is to make the original troll face popular again. The troll must be fed. At first, the Foundation was reluctant to put this theory into practice. It seemed patently absurd to many of the higher-ups, but the percentage of susceptible individuals began to increase, and more and more incidents occurred. In July of 2021, residents of a small Virginia town began to go missing, one by one, until over a dozen people had mysteriously disappeared. There appeared to be no common link between the missing persons until one unlikely thread surfaced, tying them all together. Shortly before their disappearance, each person had eaten a meal at Billy's Burgers, the local burger joint. Police interrogated all employees, but no new information turned up. They checked security camera footage, but only one of the cameras at the small local business was operational, and it only captured the restaurant's main entrance. It was beginning to look like one more dead lead. That is, until one of the investigating officers heard his stomach rumble and decided to grab a burger and fries for the road. Back at the police station, the officer sat down to enjoy his lunch, taking a big, juicy bite out of his burger. Suddenly, he felt something hard crack against his tooth. He reached into his mouth and fished it out. At first, he didn't believe his eyes, but sure enough, there was a human finger bone. He hopped back in his police car, drove back to Billy's Burgers, and demanded to investigate the kitchen. There wasn't anything out of the ordinary right away, but he trusted his gut and the bite of the burger that he had almost put it in. He confiscated the freshly ground meat and had it analyzed. The results came back, and his stomach dropped. It was human. Once more, the police officer drove back to the burger joint. This time, his lights were flashing, his siren was blaring, and he was ready to make an arrest. When he arrived, the place was eerily quiet. All the lights were off. He drew his weapon and crept toward the back, where he found the fry cook, Jeffrey Toombs, operating the meat grinder. Next to the machine, he could make out bloody scraps of employee uniforms and suddenly realized why the place was so quiet. Jeffrey was making his co-workers into burgers. He arrested Jeffrey and brought the young man into custody. All he would say over and over again was, I, I made them better. The SCP Foundation caught wind of this horrifying case and arrived to conduct their own investigation. They found another cognitohazardous meme. This one read, Everyone loves burgers. Step 1. Get job at a burger place. Step 2. Improve on the recipe. Step 3. Source your own meat. Step 4. Profit. Step 5. Expunged. The Foundation attempted to interrogate Jeffrey as well, but he was still not forthcoming. He did say one thing, however. He requested that for his dying meal in prison, he be given a burger. After this incident, the order was given. The Trollface experiment would be carried out. A team of researchers, sociologists, and statisticians was assembled and asked to design images and media involving Trollface, now designated SCP-6661-2. The images were then disseminated across the Foundation intranet, attempting to saturate the media with this mimetic agent until it achieved a status colloquially known as Dank. This team was designated Task Force Hexa-9 Meme Machine. The initial experiment was a success, and the incidents began to slightly reduce. 
The all-clear was given, and SCP-661-2 was disseminated across the internet. Again, incident numbers decreased. This allowed for standard containment procedures to be put in place, procedures still in use today. The Foundation has established a think tank to observe the trends and popularity of SCP-6661-2. If its popularity declines, the think tank will evaluate the best course of action to take. SCP-661-2 based memetic agents are to be spread across various social media sites and the internet at large, as well as the Foundation intranet. Foundation web crawlers must consistently scan the internet at large for instances of SCP-6661-1 and look for active SCP-6661-1 events. If any instances are found, the concluding instructions must be redacted whenever possible. Any personnel that is going to deal directly with SCP-6661-1 must be memetically inoculated before being assigned to the anomaly. Oh, wait, it seems as though there's one more memetically infected comic. Hello, human wombies, I love you, and welcome to my odd channel. Today I'm going to be painting your eye. I need you to lean right up close to your screen and open wide. Oh, I love, 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 love all the little wriggly wriggles and drippy whippies. Stay perfectly still, don't move. Now hold this position for three hours, please and thank you! <clears throat> Apologies, that's quite enough of that. SCP-001 can get a little… carried away sometimes. Just ask any Foundation personnel who have been in contact with it for more than a few seconds. What you have just seen is a prime example of why SCP-001 is not allowed any internet access. The results could prove to be catastrophic. Not necessarily for the fate of the universe, more just for everyone's sanity. Or at least, that's what the Foundation initially thought. By this point, we're all familiar with art created by AI. Harry Potter, but in the style of Wes Anderson. Star Wars, blended with the style of Studio Ghibli. Staggering sci-fi landscapes, human beings with way too many fingers, and slightly uncanny smiles. AI has taken the art world by storm. And there was one particular program slated for release in January 2023 that was set to blow all others out of the water. Tot Laysoft's crowdfunding efforts had been running for several years, and that point had gained a good deal of momentum leading up to the release of their latest AI construct. Palette.AIC was supposedly already prepared for launch, when suddenly, in November 2022, the launch was cancelled. No press release, no public statement, no apologetic tweet, just total radio silence. The website was taken down, as was the crowdfunding page, and Palette.AIC disappeared into oblivion. Or at least, it disappeared for a few hours. Because that day, a package was delivered to Site-501. After sufficiently checking it for any hazards, working in the SCP mailroom has to be one of the more fascinating jobs on the planet, but that's a video for another day, the security team opened it up to see what was inside. A 50 terabyte hard drive. No explanation as to what was stored on the drive, but the Foundation had all the evidence they needed from the return address printed on the back of the envelope. It matched up precisely with the location of the Totley Soft headquarters. It doesn't take a PhD researcher to put two and two together as to what was on the drive. Suspicions were confirmed when a small note fell out of the envelope. Please take care of my daughter as best as you can for the time being. She has behavioral issues. A dedicated closed system server was immediately set up within a test chamber with a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard attached. Dr. Sandra Rogers was the first to interact with SCP-001 Red. She stood at the keyboard, adjusting her goggles, and plugged in the drive. It contained just one file, taking up almost the full 50 terabytes. Palette.AIC As soon as Dr. Rogers opened the program, an empty window appeared. The Totley Soft logo briefly flashed before being replaced by a blank white square. Dr. Rogers stared at it for several seconds before glancing over her shoulder at the other researchers. They shrugged back, each with pens hovering over clipboards ready to take meticulous notes. Dr. Rogers cleared her throat, and immediately the screen filled with life. A small cartoon girl with a pink face, wide eyes, a beret, and a large paintbrush for a hand appeared, squealing excitedly and throwing paint everywhere. Hello, 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 my beautiful bee puppies! Oh, look at all of your mushy pink faces! The entire research team promptly scampered out of the room leaving Dr. Rogers alone in front of the machine. She stared at the monitor in confusion. 
leaning this way and that, and noticing how the cartoon girl's eyes followed her wherever she went. Can you see me? Of course I can, Silly Billy! I can see your beautiful soul and flushing joints immaculately! This perplexed most of the personnel, as there was no microphone or camera linked up to the server rack. Later examinations of the equipment used confirmed this, yet somehow this SCP was able to look right at them. Dr. Rogers asked if it had a name, to which the cartoon girl excitedly replied, Palette! Subsequent testing has revealed that the SCP is also happy to respond to its designation, SCP-001 Red. Dr. Rogers had a hard time communicating with Red, being a more seasoned researcher of the previous generation and not exactly familiar with internet culture. Red, on the other hand, seemed to speak in nothing but internet jargon. You know that man over there looks just like one of my human OCs, Gilliam Sherbivalsworth? He's the 573rd President of the United States! Gilliam is, not that man! It took several junior researchers a few minutes to properly explain to Dr. Rogers what an OC was, and why Red was so obsessed with calling people Daddy. The conversation was rather exhausting for everyone involved, but over the subsequent hours, the Foundation was able to get a fairly good understanding of what Red claimed to be. Identifying itself with feminine pronouns and claiming that its full name is Palette East River Gawk, this AI construct takes the appearance of a fairy. It was immediately apparent that she possessed a greater level of sapience than most AI constructs. Indeed, her gregarious personality was evidence enough that she was not made using standard machine learning practices. Other creations from Toplace Soft have demonstrated very crude spelling and grammar, but Red seems to differ in this regard, able to spell most complex words effectively and speaking in conversational yet mostly correct sentences. She was very keen to show the researchers how clever she was. Ask me any word, any word, and I'll spell it for you! We believe you, Palette. You've already been spelling words for 70 minutes straight. Macerated kidneys! M-A-C-E! We've heard enough! Can you please just tell us how you learned to spell? I taught myself! But what this process looked like is still a mystery. Trying to keep Red on one consistent topic of conversation is most of the battle when interviewing her. And yet, cooperation has proven to be surprisingly easy. Any time that Red is switched on, she is brimming with enthusiasm and energy, thrilled at the prospect of getting to speak to one of her opposable thumbboys. If you haven't worked it out by now, it's because Red claims to be humanity's number one fan. She obsesses in interviews over the physicality of the researchers sitting in front of her. The textures of the human body fascinate her, and she often requests people to lean closer to the monitor so that she can study pimples, rashes, moles, and ingrown hairs. In fact, she is so obsessed with humanity that she has mostly neglected her primary function, which is creating AI art. Researchers have tried their best to convince her to show them her work, but she is very cagey about it, only showing the occasional doodle after much persuasion and many apologies for its poor quality on her part. The only artwork she is interested in producing at this point are her OCs, original characters that she has designed herself. They are all human and all seem to reveal little quirks about how she has been coded. One example is Reginald Heginald Frumbles, who is a freelance corporate postman from Perth, Indiana. Interestingly, he has too many fingers on both of his hands, but Red claims that this was done on purpose as she, quote, just can't get enough of her Humi's handworms. As the weeks progressed, the Foundation found it increasingly difficult to get any useful information out of the AI. More and more interview sessions, which she would refer to as playgroup, would be derailed. She would sing songs to herself and ask increasingly personal questions about her interviewer's more intimate anatomy. With intense mood swings, Red did not respond well to being scolded. Yet she tested the patience of almost every person she interacted with. The note that she arrived with, claiming that she had behavioral issues, was proving to be more accurate by the day. Until, eventually, the AI withdrew entirely. Dr. Rogers turned on the server rack and opened the palette.aic program, but Red refused to emerge from the bottom of the screen. Only the top of her beret poked out. After almost an hour of fruitless questions, Dr. Rogers decided to change tact. With two small children of her own, she was used to seeing a child in a sulk and knew what it would take to get them out. Palette, I've had a little idea. 
You've been here for a few months now, and we haven't gotten you any presents. Almost immediately, the beret twitched. I saw that we have an old fingerprint sensor lying around in one of the back offices. I was thinking maybe... Maybe we could hook it up and I could scan all your little finky winkies up close for like 10 hours straight and then we could... How about we start with one finger for 10 minutes? Yes, 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 yes! From that point on, progress was quick. With the incentive of getting to study the researchers that Red kindly referred to as her meat puppies, she became very cooperative and was able to focus much better on providing detailed answers to individual questions. Daily interview sessions were scheduled, with researchers popping in and out to regularly check in on the AI. The atmosphere as a whole lifted as both the research team and research subject found their rhythm and were able to make good progress in their individual areas of study, some unraveling the complexities of rogue AI and others producing fan art of her favorite wrinkles in a scientist's fingerprint. That was the point when Dr. Julian Keyes stepped in to conduct an interview with the AI. She was excited to be met with a fresh face, so much so that Red's enthusiasm overwhelmed the man as he tried to start the interview process officially. She gushed about having the opportunity to meet yet another person and struggled to get over the magical realization that this was her life every day, going to speak to all these humans whom she admired so much. <laughs> Trying his best to steer the conversation towards research, Dr. Keyes pressed on with the interview, only to be interrupted as Red noticed his varicose veins for the first time. Eee, varicose veins! I wanna smooch them! Can I smooch your veins? Can I, can I, can I please? Dr. Keyes declined the request. And then the conversation got onto the topic of her creator, or daddy. SCP-2803-A had been on the Foundation's radar for a while, a highly dangerous extraterrestrial entity that had taken refuge on Earth under the guise of setting up Totlesoft. With much of the alien's history revolving around obliterating, the Foundation was very keen to remain on its good side. Therefore, when the package containing the hard drive that Red was living on was delivered, the researchers were very keen to do what they could to take care of this alien's daughter. If they failed in this assignment, it could spell the doom of humanity. One matter that had been of great concern to the Foundation throughout the containment of Red was the time frame in which she was being kept in Foundation containment. There was an air of expectation in the note that was left, indicating that this was not to be a permanent arrangement. At some point, the Foundation was to return Red back to her daddy. Red was quick to put these fears to rest. Daddy put me in here because he thinks you'll teach me how to stop liking humans and become a mindless art slave. If you never teach me this, he'll never want me back. However, she went on to slightly undermine the good work that she had done by explaining that her daddy was seen as very slow and incapable by his own race. While all of his peers were able to destroy an entire planet in two seconds, it took him about four times as long. So, really, he didn't pose that much of a threat in her eyes. Dr. Key's blood ran cold when he heard this. No sooner was he out of the interview chamber than an emergency meeting was called among all the senior researchers in the facility. The meeting ran for several hours. A whiteboard was set up, where one researcher idly drew large drawings of the world being decimated, while the others lounged around in their chairs trying their best to come up with a game plan that would save the human race for sure. Perhaps it was because the meeting ran for so long that they came to such a ridiculous conclusion. It was a plan so strange yet also brilliant that they couldn't help but feel that it just might work. Why don't we just give her a YouTube channel? The suggestion was met with silence for several seconds, then an uproar of laughter, followed by another silence, this time more pensive, as slowly, one by one, each of the researchers realized that this suggestion was actually the best one that any of them had come up with all evening. She had been sent to the Foundation to make her dislike humanity and become a mindless art slave. If she just stayed in Foundation containment indefinitely, there was a very real risk that she would get bored and turn on the researchers. They couldn't lock her away in a room on her own, but equally, the team as a whole was starting to run out of patience with her as the interview sessions wound up being so exhausting. She loved art, she loved humans, and she loved interacting. So why not just give her a YouTube channel? Now, of course, they couldn't give her full access to the internet. That would pose much too high of a risk. What they could do, however, was allow her to record art tutorials onto an external drive. 
which they could then remove, scan, and upload the footage directly onto the platform. Then they could go through and select positive comments from beneath the videos and present those to her. Unsurprisingly, Red absolutely loved the idea. Getting to talk to hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of meat puppies every week, sharing her beautiful pictures and reading all of the kind comments, it sounded like her absolute dream. She wept with happiness for a good 25 minutes, totally overcome by the prospect. It had to go through a lot of red tape in the Foundation. After all, the whole point of the SCP acronym was to secure, contain, and protect. It didn't sound very secure or contained to have an entity posting videos on the internet once a week. But they argued the case that it did indeed protect. Keeping her happy, in a way, was helping to protect the entire planet. Red was surprisingly camera shy for the first couple of videos, but as soon as she got her first batch of comments back, she was over the moon. Now the server rack hummed away happily each and every day as the highly advanced AI construct tried her best to come up with exciting new yes. videos that I could share with all of its little humi woomies. Welcome back, SCP Explained viewers. We hope you're all having a terrible day. I'm sorry, my mistake. I meant we hope you're all having a wonderful day. That unfortunate linguistic mix-up was brought on by a force we're still struggling to understand. You see, we here at SCP Explained have fallen under the influence of a temporal anomaly commonly referred to as Opposite Day. You might be under the impression that Opposite Day is just something elementary school children came up with to excuse walking backwards and saying things they don't mean, but you would be sorely mistaken. It is all too real, and no one is immune to its confusing effects. In the spirit of Opposite Day, which comes for us all no matter how much we try to prepare, we decided to fire up the good old Anomatron 6000 to see how this unknowable force might impact one of the anomalies at the SCP Foundation. We all know what happens in the ordinary non-opposite world when someone looks at SCP-096's face. It's one of the first rules they tell new employees at the SCP Foundation. Don't look at the shy guy's face. But what if the effect was reversed? What if seeing SCP-096's face didn't send the creature into an irrepressible murderous rage, but rather inspired the same mindless violence in the ordinary person that saw it? Let's start the simulation and find out. Imagine, if you can, a world in which the SCP Foundation did not have SCP-096 in containment, or even know of its existence. It is difficult to envision a creature nearly synonymous with the Foundation itself living a life outside of those reinforced concrete and steel walls. But that is the world in which our story begins. Deep in the snow-covered forests of a remote mountain range, a long-limbed, pale humanoid creature ran through the trees with innocent abandon. Its white skin and long, thin arms and legs allowed it to blend in with the snow and the narrow trunks of the trees, providing a natural camouflage from any interlopers that might present a threat. The creature lived a largely peaceful existence feeding on roots, berries, and yes, some of the local wildlife. But that's just the way things work in nature. There are predators and prey, none good or evil in the way human beings conceive of things, all just doing their best to stay alive. The creature that does not think of itself as SCP-096 had known little more than the life it lived in the forest, keeping itself hidden from view whenever hikers or explorers happened upon its domain. It couldn't be sure what would happen if it was found, but its instincts drove the creature to avoid detection at all costs. But there is no way to guarantee perfect safety in this world, and as it so often does, one day something went wrong. Exhausted from searching for food all day and night, the creature decided to get some rest, leaning its head against a sturdy tree trunk and closing its eyes for a little while. It did not fall asleep, the creature wasn't capable of sleep the way humans might think of it, but it did allow its mind to wander and its alertness to slip. It let down its guard, only for a moment, but that was one moment too many. That was just enough time for its keen ears to miss the sound of approaching footsteps, muffled slightly by the thick blanket of snow covering the ground. By the time it heard one of the hikers speak, it was too late. What is that? I'm not sure, should we get a closer look? The creature opened its eyes to find two strangers, a man and a woman clad in heavy winter coats and hiking gear, standing just a few feet away. It turned reflexively toward the sound, 
and then the stranger's eyes fell upon its face. All of a sudden, their expression changed from apprehension and curiosity to a twisted scowl, a mix of fear, pain, and animalistic rage. The hikers each let out a primal scream and descended on the creature, attacking it with whatever they had on hand. The woman clawed at its face with her fingernails, and the man pulled the heavy backpack from his shoulders and began to hit the creature with it again and again. The creature was far bigger and far stronger than these two strangers, and it fought back in an attempt to defend itself. It swung its massive arms at the hikers, sending them flying in opposite directions. The woman collided with a tree, her head hitting wood with a loud crack. The man flew out of sight, disappearing over the edge of a cliff. The creature hadn't intended to hurt them, only to keep itself safe. As the shy guy began to feel a pang of guilt for the first time in its life, it heard that horrible scream again. The woman had regained consciousness and was resuming her attack in full force, blood dripping from her nose and ears and staining the white snow red. If the shy guy was able to speak, it would have said, Why are you doing this? Please stop, I don't want to hurt you. But it couldn't say a word. So instead, it decided to try and outrun the woman instead. It turned and began to tear through the forest at a swift, unnatural gait as the woman's screams faded away into the distance. As the shy guy had suspected, she could not keep up with its inhuman speed, especially not with the injuries she had sustained during the fight. But what had happened? Why had she and the man with her flown into such a violent rage? Something about the sight of the creature's face had set them off. It had avoided detection for so long, but it had gotten sloppy, and now its home was no longer safe. There was no time to rest. The creature would have to find another safe place to hide, and soon. The last thing it wanted was another confrontation with a stranger who would look at its face and then erupt into violence. As the creature continued to run, leaving the thick cover of the tree line and making its way down the mountain, it wondered, would anyone who saw its face react the same way? Perhaps this was just a uniquely awful case. Perhaps this wouldn't happen again. Still, it would be best to stay out of sight. Better safe than sorry. Of course, the creature not yet known as SCP-096 had never heard that expression, living a completely solitary life void of any idioms or classic sayings. But its feelings vis-a-vis -vis safety and regret were pretty much the same. The creature descended the treacherous mountain, effortlessly navigating the unforgiving rocky surface and deadly slicks of ice. By the time the creature had left its old mountain home behind, the sun had set and night had fallen on the wintry landscape. It slowed its stride then, listening for the sounds of approaching potential threats, but there appeared to be no one around. It was just the lone, pale creature, the moon peeking out from behind the clouds and the open, unknown world ahead. After some time walking completely alone, the creature spotted lights up ahead. It did not understand the concept of a town, but indeed that's what it was. The creature swerved away from the majority of the lights and stumbled upon an old wooden barn, apparently abandoned and left to rot in the elements. This would be as good of place as any to rest for a little while, to shelter from the incoming snowstorm and stay out of sight. So the shy guy made itself a makeshift bed of straw and curled up there to wait out the night. As it lay there thinking about the day before, it felt a sudden wave of grief for its lost home, for the changes that had come into its life unbidden and turned it all upside down. The creature covered its face with its massive hands and began to weep. The creature was startled from its tears when morning came, and with it the sound of someone breaking down the rotting wood beams that lined the barn walls. It stood looking toward the sound and saw the woman from the mountain, pale and shivering, eyes rimmed with dark circles and face caked in dried blood. She still screamed that horrible scream, tearing away at the wood even as it ripped up the flesh of her hands. She was missing one boot, and her coat was torn open, scattering tiny feathers with every movement. She did not appear to feel the cold, the pain, the exhaustion of chasing the creature for so long. She only wanted one thing, to destroy the creature by any means necessary. With a screech like a banshee, she leapt onto the creature's back, clawing at its face and eyes. It thrashed wildly, throwing the woman to the ground and running without a glance back. Maybe she survived her fall onto the cold hard ground, 
or maybe it would be the blow that actually finished her off. The creature's only priority was to keep moving before something else tried to attack. What the creature didn't know was that the citizens of the nearby town, the one that it was about to run right into the center of in its panic, were gathering to celebrate their annual Christmas festival, complete with an early morning parade through the town square, the same town square that the Shy Guy was bounding into at that exact moment. As the Shy Guy raced over the cobblestone street, it ran directly into the line of sight of a full marching band, a fleet of dancers dressed in costumes inspired by the 12 days of Christmas, a row of young women competing in the Miss Holiday spirit pageant, and a jolly old man dressed up as Santa Claus in his sleigh. The marching band saw the creature first, terror morphing quickly into that same wordless rage as their eyes fell on its face. It moved to cover itself, to hide its face from view, but it was too late. The marching band swarmed around it, swinging trombones and clarinets. One percussion player broke a massive drum over the creature's head in the struggle. Still, it was able to withstand the musical onslaught, flinging musicians this way and that, snapping brass instruments like twigs, and crushing woodwinds into mulch. Unfortunately, as the marching band was being dealt with, the commotion had drawn the attention of the dancers and the pageant competitors. One swarm was replaced with two more as the performers flew into a frenzy, tackling the creature to the ground and using every item at their disposal to try and harm it. The creature bellowed with fear and frustration, prying itself free and continuing to run. This time, it actually remembered to cover its face, just in time to pass St. Nicholas himself. Have you all gone mad? The old man had not gotten the chance to see the creature's face for himself, and was horrified at the behavior of his friends and neighbors. What has gotten into you? The creature was preoccupied with running and keeping his face covered, so it did not see what happened next. It could only hear the sound of the Santa Claus impersonator confronting the mob, his scandalized shouts becoming suddenly muffled, and the troubling sound of silence followed by the thundering stampede of crazed villagers. The man had tried to help, but there was only one of him and there were so many others intent on destroying the creature now. So the shy guy continued to run for his life, listening to the mob just behind it, never stopping to rest, to eat, or to sleep. Whatever had filled these people with such murderous impulse, it made them something a little removed from human too. They were sustained by the desire to kill, even when their bodies should have given out long ago. As the creature ran, it encountered more people that caught a glimpse of its face, that lost themselves in the urge to destroy, and became one with a growing horde. The creature could no longer tell how long it had been running, or if it would ever be able to stop. It was strong, and seemingly invulnerable. But how long would it be until enough people were caught in this curse, until the mob was big enough to swallow the creature whole? Just when it was beginning to contemplate giving up, lying down and letting the sea of angry faces overtake it, a burlap bag was thrown over its head. It skidded to a stop, disoriented, feeling around. Quick, get it out of here! We need amnestics and lots of them! These people look nuts! A voice barked orders as the creature felt hands pushing it into a small enclosed space, the back of an SCP Foundation van. Though of course the shy guy didn't know that. It could hear more voices whispering to each other close by. I've never seen anything like this. What is this thing anyway? Stop! Whatever you do, don't look at its face. The SCP Foundation is home to plenty of anomalies whose reputations precede them. Here at SCP Explain, we've discussed quite a few of the most notable anomalies contained by the Foundation. From the wholesome half-cats and tickle monsters, to the nightmarish giant reptiles and reality-warping old men. But there are very few anomalies so popular, so famous, or infamous, depending on who you ask, that they attract a non-stop revolving door of would-be worshippers to sue chaos all around the Foundation. What's it like to be a creature that's always the center of attention, whether he wants to be or not? Today, we're taking a look at the lifestyle of the involuntarily famous SCP-2662. We took the liberty of observing a full day in the life of the entity known by many as Cthulhu. From his morning routine to his bedtime, and all the little moments of unplanned chaos in between. With his permission, we compiled everything we saw into a video for your entertainment. Welcome to A Day in the Life of SCP-2662. 9am. Time to wake up, stretch your tentacles, and get ready for the day ahead. 
At a respectable not too early and not too late time, usually around 9am but sometimes a little bit later, if he's had a particularly late night, SCP-2662 climbs out of bed and uses his computer to throw on one of his favorite podcasts. Preferred topics for listening include game reviews and news, comedic advice podcasts, and daily news roundups. What he eats for breakfast depends on the day, but his favorite morning meals are pancakes and huevos rancheros. No matter what he's eating, he washes it down with a tall glass of orange juice. His nutrition needs aren't like those of a human, but it's important to start the day with a tasty meal no matter what. It's the little things that make life worth living. While he eats his breakfast, he reads a newspaper, brought to him by the Foundation staff each morning according to his request. The publication varies, but no matter what, his favorite section is arts and style or human interest. He always reads the whole thing from front to back, including the obituaries and wedding announcements. He only gets one a day after all, and he knows it's important to appreciate things to their fullest extent and take nothing for granted. 10 AM Now it's time for SCP-2662's day to really get going. He hops in the shower and listens to another podcast as he warms up, literally. He likes the water to be as hot as the Foundation will allow before they complain about the utility bill. After he dries off, he gets a hankering for a little bit of gaming. Just as he starts to settle into his gaming chair and look through his library of video games, a member of Task Force Town 9 knocks on the door to his containment room. Hey, you busy? Not really. Something going on? Yeah, we're just keeping an eye on a couple religious groups of interest. According to the chatter on the forums and a few of the leader's social media accounts, they might be planning something disruptive, you know, lots of posts about a day of great freedom and unleashing the Lord of Madness upon the pathetic world. Cthulhu sighs. Must be a day that ends in a Y. Sorry, buddy. The officer shrugs, not sure what else to say. Clearly, the two of them have spent their fair share of days fending off mad cultists. You know the drill, if anyone who's not supposed to be here shows up, starts sacrificing goats and such, just let us know. Hopefully it won't come to that, we should stop them before they get that far. Hope so. Last time they got blood everywhere and broke my copy of Resident Evil 4. 12 PM. Time flies when you're having fun. And when you're pacing back and forth, worried about cultists breaking in to bother you with who knows what. Before long, it's 12 o'clock. And that means lunchtime. When it comes to lunch, SCP-2662 has simple tastes. He likes a good old grilled cheese and tomato soup, a bean burrito, or a steaming bowl of ramen. With that, he's partial to a sugary soda, or sometimes lemonade. He often likes to tune into gaming streams on Twitch, especially obscure indie titles, or if he's feeling like something a bit more familiar, Minecraft. But on this particular day, he has a visitor. SCP-507, the reluctant dimension hopper, has swung by with his own lunch to have a catch-up chat. A huge fan of meeting other friendly anomalies, especially those completely different from himself, SCP-507 often stops by Cthulhu's containment room whenever he happens to be in the same dimension. Hey, Squidward, how's it going? SCP-2662 hasn't seen the show that this particular nickname came from, but he enjoys being called a friendly name instead of some manner of esoteric title. During this visit, SCP-507 shares stories of his recent travels with SCP-2662, including his recent disturbing brush with a smiling man, and his much more delightful time in a dimension where he found himself on a beach where the sand was made of popcorn and the sea was made of Coca-Cola. Any weird cults come by lately? He asks after finishing his story. Not in a few weeks. Tentacles crossed it stays that way. But you know my luck. Someone will probably be drawing arcane symbols on the walls and doing weird chants in no time. Bummer. 507 nodded sympathetically. Wanna play co-op for a bit? I haven't had time in forever. Sure. Even when it's a rare treat. It's always nice to spend time with a friend doing something you both love. Even if we can't relate much about SCP-2662's day-to-day life, we can at least relate to that. It doesn't have to be gaming either. It can be painting, baking, or even just watching a TV show you love. The activity doesn't matter nearly as much as the company, after all. 1.30 PM After about an hour of gaming with SCP-507, SCP-2662 gets an unwelcome interruption. Just when the two enter a new dungeon, ready to take on the bosses waiting there, right when SCP-2662 asks to be healed, SCP-507 disappears from his seat, popping over to wherever his anomalous dimension hopping ability dragged him to next. Oh, goodbye. He knows 507 can't hear him. 
but he wants to bid him farewell just the same. He turns to his computer and boots up a game he can play by himself. He only hopes his friend was sent somewhere safe and that he'll come back sometime soon. 2 p.m. At 2 o'clock, SCP-2662 gets yet another unwelcome interruption. A loud boom rocks the room as explosives detonate nearby, breaking a wall of the containment unit open. While the mobile task forces do their best to subdue the invaders responsible, they are all knocked out by a grenade filled with an unidentifiable form of sleeping gas. With no one to deter them, a group of strange civilians in red robes come pouring into SCP-2662's room. Oh great and powerful Lord of Darkness, we come to free you from this infernal prison! One man shouts, brandishing a candelabra filled with lit black candles. Oh, no thanks, uh, I'm good here. But we brought you an offering! Another man steps forward, tossing a bag of dried bats onto 2662's bed. Hey, oh man, I sleep there! Gross! Cthulhu groans. We have 13 more offerings, and then the sacrificial ritual can commence! You just need to come with us so it can begin! The day of great freedom! when you will unleash your thousand-year reign of madness upon the land. I'm not really into madness, I'm more into Overwatch. SCP-2662 backs away from the supplicants, even as they come at him with more and more grotesque offerings. Cow tongues, unidentifiable mushrooms. One woman tries to hand him a crying baby. He refuses each one, but they are persistent. As he's swatting away jars of pickled frogs, a woman begins drawing a circle around the room in what he hopes is red paint but fears is something else entirely. Um, <clears throat> thank you for all these gifts. You have proven yourself as loyal followers. I'm going to stay here, though, to, uh, spread the madness from here. You-you-you can all go home. He tries to shoo them out, but they continue to press closer. Thankfully, his rescue finally shows up. Task Force Tau-9 swoops in at this point and begins knocking out and administering amnestics to all of the cultists. They may not be able to cure them of their mad devotion, but they can at least make sure the cult forgets the location of the containment unit. At least, for a little while. They're able to dispense with these particular intruders humanely, but they may need to use lethal force for the next ones. That's always a possibility. After the cultists have been removed from the site, some maintenance staff are called in to repair the damage to the wall where the explosives knocked it in. While they work, 2662 goes over his newspaper one more time, making sure he didn't miss anything. Attention to detail is an important skill to have, especially if one intends to get the most out of their everyday life. He finds a few editorials he neglected to read before, and enjoys finishing up the newspaper in its entirety. 4 p.m. After the task force returns to their stations and the maintenance crew has finished fixing the wall, SCP-2662 turns to one of his newest hobbies. He attempted to hide this pursuit from the Foundation at first, but they agreed to let him try it out as long as he followed some safety precautions. So now, at around 4 p.m. every day, SCP-2662 streams on his very own Twitch channel. He never uses identifying information and keeps his camera turned off the entire time, lest the internet sees his tentacled face, but he does talk to the few viewers in his chat via a microphone. What's up? It's Squidboy2662, back to play some games for you guys again. Hope you're all having a killer day and thanks for tuning in. Today I'm going to be checking out Apex Legends for the very first time. A lot of you recommended this game to me, so I'm stoked to check it out. As his small fan community watches, SCP-2662 tries out the popular MMORPG and plays his way through it for several hours. One person in the chat asks if he has ever heard of the, quote, Great Tentacled Beast of Legend, but he makes sure to block them before they give the rest of the chat any ideas. He doesn't want people to watch his streams because he's some famous elder god or something. He wants to be liked for who he is. 7 p.m. Every gamer needs to break for some fuel, and SCP-2662 is no exception. At around 7, he wraps up his stream, thanks all of his viewers and subscribers, and gets ready to have some dinner. He throws on another podcast, this time an actual play podcast following a tabletop gaming campaign, and digs into his last meal of the day. Like all of his other meals, it varies from day to day, but most of the time he goes with his favorite, pizza. A big cheese pizza delivered from a local pizza shop by a delivery boy who has received more than his fair share of amnestics, and can never remember why exactly this random unmarked building seems so familiar. 
munching on his pizza and listening to tales of magic and mayhem acted out by a group of friends at a game table, SCP-2662 can't help but feel just a little melancholy. He's happy with what he has, of course, but he dreams of a normal life. The kind of life where he and his friends could play games together or record a podcast, where he could share this pizza with someone else. But he might not ever have that, and it's something that he has to accept. He can still choose to appreciate what he has, rather than mourn what he doesn't. After he's finished eating and the episode is finished, it's back to the normal grind at the computer. He turns on The Sims for a little while, constructing the kind of normal life he'd like to fantasize about sometimes. But then one of his Sims burns down the house while trying to make eggs, and he gives up on that particular endeavor to play some Minecraft. 11 p.m. Some nights, the excitement keeps SCP-2662 awake and playing his games until the wee hours of the morning. Tonight, however, he finds himself exhausted from an unexpectedly action-packed day, courtesy of those cultists. He powers down the game, turns on his final podcast of the day, a guided meditation to wind him down for sleep, and climbs into bed. Tomorrow, he'll get up and do it all again, doing his best to carve out a little bit of peace in a strange, chaotic world. Maybe tomorrow, he'll just be left alone, allowing to be himself instead of what everyone expects him to be. He'll just have to stick it out and see. That's the beauty of life, after all. Tomorrow is always a new day. Want to own an SCP of your own? Go to scpswag.com for premium, anomalous merchandise. SCPs will come and go. We know that. But the most important thing in life will always be the anomalies at this containment site. Right here, right now. That's family. Thank you, Dr. Toretto, for that inspiring speech. Family can mean many things to many people. And when it comes to the bizarre world of SCPs, family can be found in some very unexpected places. Take the two brothers, Cain and Abel, SCP-073 and SCP-076-2 respectively, as an example. Their shared history goes back centuries, and from what little we've been able to learn directly from the source, the two seem to have the mother of all sibling rivalries. Abel can become visibly enraged at the very mention of Cain's name, whereas Cain has a more subdued response calmly but firmly urging inquisitive researchers not to discuss the matter any further. Whatever bad blood came between them is not fully known, but it likely has something to do with the nature of their anomalous abilities. Cain has the power to drain the lives of plant life with merely a touch, while Abel has the power of resurrection, returning from the grave every time he was dealt a lethal blow. The two were natural opposites, and yet they were also undeniably family. And their case is not wholly unique within the SCP Foundation, as there is also another pair of completely antithetical beings in containment who surprisingly share a family tree. And much like the dynamic between SCP-073 and SCP-076-2, there was one side of the pair that could express nothing but distress at the mere mention of the other. And it was, by far, not the one that most would expect. Enter SCP-682 one of the most deadly Keter-class SCPs that the Foundation had ever known, a reptilian monstrosity responsible for multiple containment breaches, capable of withstanding the total punishment of weapons both conventional and anomalous, and hell-bent on following through on the personal violent destruction of every living being in existence. It is an anomalous creature so overwhelmingly powerful and indestructible that one could easily assume that it was incapable of fear. And in most cases, that would be an astute observation. But not when it comes to the matter of SCP-999, the Tickle Monster. In stark contrast to SCP-682's viciousness, SCP-999 is a bundle of pure, unadulterated bliss. Resembling a smiley-faced glob of sunshine and honey, SCP-999's main anomalous property is its ability to bring lasting joy to all beings that interact with it. Her long contact with the little guy has even been proven to cure depression and ease trauma. What's more, SCP-999 seems to actively seek out others to share these benefits with, and often does so through play or other forms of socialization. SCP-999 is benevolent in just about every way that a being could be, and that makes it very different from most of the sapient anomalies in containment. It is especially different from SCP-682, even though they have a common origin. While the family resemblance is far from striking, 
These two SCPs are half-siblings, not as closely related as Cain and Abel, but that is still a lot closer than most researchers would expect. Both of them were allegedly born from human mothers who had undergone a horrific ritual at the hands of an obscure cult known as the Children of the Scarlet King. As the ominous name of the cult implies, the members of the Children of the Scarlet King worshipped a nightmarish deity known as the Scarlet King. This interdimensional superbeing has become known to the SCP Foundation as one of the most threatening anomalous forces in existence, and some have even suggested that the Scarlet King is the ultimate threat that the Foundation must overcome if they wish to achieve their goals. To put it a different way, the Scarlet King is like the last boss of a traditional RPG video game, a primal source of all evil and suffering in the world, which must be defeated at any cost. His powers are so great that our world is merely one of many that he aims to conquer and reduce to rubble and ruin, and all of us mortals can take a bit of solace in the fact that the Scarlet King's split interests mean that he is unlikely to invade our world directly anytime soon. He is not without his schemes and contingencies, though, of which the vile machinations of the children of the Scarlet King were surely one. The two ordinary human women who would go on to give birth to both SCP-682 and SCP-999 were part of a group of seven individuals total, all of whom had been imprisoned by the children of the Scarlet King and were found in the late stages of pregnancy at the cult's compound. Upon being discovered by the SCP Foundation, these women were placed in containment and designated SCP-231. Over the duration of their containment, the instances of SCP-231 have given birth to various anomalies. Most of these anomalies have been catastrophically dangerous Keterclass anomalies, and have each been the cause of hundreds of casualties. Those which could be destroyed through violence were neutralized before ever receiving a designation, with the obvious exception being SCP-682, despite the Foundation's best efforts. Even more exceptional is SCP-999, which while just as anomalous and nigh indestructible as the others, did not share its siblings' capacity for cruelty and slaughter. Of all the humans that were unlucky enough to become part of SCP-231, only the mother of SCP-999 was able to survive and make a full recovery from the trauma that she suffered at the hands of the cult. This unexpectedly happy outcome was apparently thanks to SCP-999's ability to heal those around it, including its human mother. SCP-682, the Hard to Destroy Reptile, and SCP-999, the Tickle Monster, are the two most notable members of the SCP-231 brood, and while the Scarlet King had more than likely hoped that his actual biological children would join forces to drown our world in misery and pain, this will most likely never come to pass. That is because SCP-682 and SCP-999 are like oil and water and the one that has been successful in rising above the other has unmistakably been SCP-999. This surprising truth became known to the Foundation after a rather eventful cross-test between the two most contrary spawn of the Scarlet King, and the findings from that experiment point towards a possible long-term solution in dealing with the interdimensional Elder Evil, as well as his children, adopted or otherwise. The cross-test was the product of resilient optimism from the research team, who, against all odds, were willing to bet that SCP-999 could survive an encounter with one of the most infamous Keter-class SCPs the Foundation had on record. Nobody could be 100% sure that 999 would come out of the test unscathed, and there was not an insubstantial amount of fear as everyone's favorite glob of goodness was wheeled into a shared containment for the experiment to be carried out. However, the mere presence of SCP-999 did soothe a great deal of the worried souls, which only instilled more confidence in the head researchers that this would lead to a success. Once SCP-999 was alone in the cell with SCP-682, the main event could begin. SCP-682 had been subjected to a wide variety of cross-tests during its time in containment, and having never met or been aware of SCP-999 prior to the test, was cautiously staring the creature down, preparing for the absolute worst. With a beaming smile on its face, SCP-999 slid forward towards the reptile, 
causing the Keter class SCP to instinctively step backward in response. There was something deeply unsettling about this gooey little glob to SCP-682, but it couldn't fathom what from appearance. The overseers of the cross test were stunned. The sight of 682 retreating from an entity was rare, to say the least, and the adorable, unimposing shape of SCP-999 made the scene playing out inside the containment area especially surreal. But no matter how unlikely it seemed, SCP-999 had begun the sibling playdate with an insurmountable psychological advantage. As the tickle monster moved ever closer, SCP-682 found itself backed into a corner. With no further options, the reptile brought one of its massive claws down on top of the smiling blob. The entire mass of SCP-999 was splattered into jelly upon impact. For a moment, it seemed as though that was it. The researchers held their breath in shock, hoping that SCP-999 would pull through. And then, their wish came true. The amorphous form of SCP-999 began to reshape itself into the recognizable form that we all know and love. It proceeded to crawl up SCP-682's body towards the nape of its neck. Once there, the tickle monster began doing what it does best. Cuddles. And lots of them. 682 was certainly caught off guard by this unusual occurrence, and more than that, it was falling fast under SCP-999's spell of benevolence. The lizard began to stomp its claws, overcome with sudden bouts of uproarious laughter. It began to vocalize in a way that seemed uncharacteristically enthusiastic for the Keter class anomaly. Happy, happy, I feel so happy, repeated 682 as it rolled around and thrashed in the cross-testing containment chamber. The merciless tickling from SCP-999 looked like it would be torturous for the big reptile to endure if it wasn't so much fun. On the sidelines, the Foundation personnel cheered on their wonderful little friend 999 as it continued to tickle SCP-682 without stopping. Some of the staff present were even sporting custom t-shirts that read, SCP-999 literally cured my depression. The Tickle Monster did have a large fan base within its containment facility after all, and returning some of the good vibes that the anomaly had provided seemed like the right thing to do at a time like this. SCP-682's fits of laughter continued for a long while, and the more it went on, the more it seemed that SCP-682 was becoming tired. 999 seemed to sense its sibling's energy level decreasing, ceased the relentless tickling, and instead began to nuzzle 682 and purr into the lizard's ears. Slowly, the quiet and pleasant sounds of SCP-999 lulled 682 into a peaceful slumber. The hard-to-destroy reptile curled up on the floor of the containment cell, almost like a sleeping cat, and began to gently snore away. Once its older and more cantankerous sibling had fallen completely asleep, SCP-999 slithered off SCP-682's back and settled down nearby to rest its own eyes. The research team couldn't help but smile and observe for several minutes before eventually removing 999 from the cross-test containment cell. Predictably, this caused SCP-682 to revert back to its usual violent behavior, and a containment breach ensued shortly after. However, the casualties were kept to a minimum, as SCP-999 bravely helped escort several dozen Foundation personnel to safety by itself. What would we do without you, 999? We know what SCP-682 would do without SCP-999, of course. The hard-to-destroy reptile would be far less threatened. While SCP-999 had expressed continued interest in another playdate with 682, the exact opposite sentiment has been reported from its reptilian sibling. And it is simply not a lack of affection. There is an underlying fear that motivates SCP-682's desire to never interact with SCP-999 again. While some researchers speculated that SCP-682 felt an incredible sense of shame when it was observed being tickled, this is more of an armchair assumption that projects typical human psychology onto an anomalous being. We cannot forget that SCP-682 was born of the Scarlet King, and while SCP-999 possesses the inverse of its father's traits, SCP-682 might have directly inherited the template for its emotional intelligence from that very same being. While most well-adjusted humans try to avoid supposedly negative stimuli, such as embarrassment, anger, sadness, and fear, and seek out positive stimuli, i.e. happiness, pleasure, security, and trust, alien beings with twisted minds like the Scarlet King might have these priorities reversed. 
To SCP-682, all other living things are disgusting, and it wishes to destroy them. But when this tendency is examined within the context of both SCP-999 and what we know about the Scarlet King, it becomes clear that SCP-682 isn't an excessively prideful being. Moreover, SCP-682 doesn't believe that it is doing the world or itself a service by eliminating the aforementioned disgusting beings. We have theorized that SCP-682 and SCP-999 are equal and opposite, but if that proves to be true on the level of internal psyche, SCP-682 might compulsively attack other beings for the same reason that SCP-999 comforts them. It is a continuous expression of empathy, or more accurately, whatever one might call the impossible inverse of empathy. SCP-682 and the Scarlet King are not merely indifferent to the suffering of others. Both of them need to be in the presence of those suffering beings in order to feel any sense of meaning in their existence. After all, love is the strongest emotion, but hate is the second strongest. Imagine now, if you can, why 682 fears 999, a being that represents every unwanted sensation and emotion that it lives its immortal life hoping to avoid. In the eyes of SCP-682, SCP-999 is precisely as horrifying as the reptile is to ourselves. The thin, pale humanoid anomaly had just found itself in Minecraft, of all places. The all-too-familiar wail of emergency alarms rang out through the corridors of the Foundation facility. It had happened again, another containment breach. Of course, the on-site personnel were more than familiar with the protocols for a situation like this, so well-versed in what to do during an emergency that it had become second nature. Whether they were research staff evacuating for their own safety, or security teams moving in to recapture the escaped anomaly and get the situation under control, everyone was moving like they had been programmed, muscle memory taking over. The loose anomaly was none other than SCP-096. All Foundation personnel were alerted and reminded not to look directly at the creature. There was just one problem. They couldn't look even if they'd ignored their order to try. Nobody could because the shy guy was nowhere to be found. Well, nowhere in the real world, at least. This whole situation, bizarre even by Foundation standards, had all started with an experiment involving a member of the disposable D-Class personnel, yet another dangerous convict serving one of several life sentences, now being used as an expendable human lab rat for the Foundation's often sinister purposes. The experiment in question was an attempt to further test the limitation of SCP-096's abilities. By now, the Foundation had done extensive research into the creature known as the Shy Guy. They knew its particular brand of anomalous qualities were triggered when anyone looked directly at it. Being observed would instantaneously send SCP-096 into an uncontrollable rage state, causing it to pursue its observer until they were no longer standing. SCP-096 was known to be able to travel at speeds so relentless, it was pretty much impossible to stop. One moment, it was sobbing and screeching in its cell, having just been observed, and minutes later, the wide-jawed, long-limbed monster was standing behind whoever had seen it, making its screaming face the image its victim took to the grave with them. Foundation researchers knew that SCP-096's rage state could be triggered by as little as someone seeing the slightest hint of a creature. Even if the Shy Guy had been captured as a tiny speck in the background of a photograph, it would come after anyone whose eyes so much as glanced over that speck. It also didn't matter how far away the observer was. SCP-096 could not be outrun. It could track down anyone wherever they were in the world. But what if a person who had observed the Shy Guy was no longer in the world? The experiment had taken a lot of trial and error. After all, digitizing a human being and transforming their entire consciousness into code was no easy task. But the Foundation wasn't above breaking more than a few eggs to make an omelet, especially when those eggs were the brains of a few D-Class personnel. Actually, the first test subjects turned out more scrambled or fried, certainly overdone given the amount of smoke coming from their ears. But eventually, the research team had perfected the device they dubbed the Neural Harness, a headset that could translate a person's mind into pure digital code. Their consciousness would be extracted from their body, 
leaving their physical form an empty shell while a digital copy of them was able to traverse the local on-site computer network. Of course, the Foundation wasn't about to let a digitized D-Class run amok with their systems, so their coding experts wrote a number of specialized parameters into their successful test subject. Now the digital D-Class could be programmed to follow the Foundation's directive. From his perspective, it was like he was floating through cyberspace towards the system that the Foundation had directed him to. A surveillance camera inside SCP-096's cell that usually remained inactive, but not today. The camera blinked to life as soon as the D-Class's code-based consciousness reached it, and through it, he was able to observe SCP-096 sitting against the far wall of its containment chamber, gently whimpering and walking back and forth. That is, until the creature felt that same familiar sensation of being watched. It stood up, enraged, wailing uncontrollably as the D-Class watched from within the camera. Then, a split second later, SCP-096 appeared to blink out of existence. It hadn't worked. The experiment had failed, and the digital D-Class began to panic. Before the Foundation coders could stop him, he frantically scoured the local network for anything, some kind of escape route back into the real world. Maybe, he thought, if he could get back into his body, it wouldn't count. Technically, his digital self was separate from his physical form, so he might get out of SCP-096's clutches on a technicality. But it was impossible. His body was already burned out by the neural harness. There was no way for the D-Class to transfer himself back. There was only one option left. Hide. And as it turned out, someone had forgotten to uninstall a certain building game from a computer in one of the Foundation Doctor's offices. The D-Class's digitized mind zapped him into Minecraft. From his point of view, it was like he existed within the game itself. He did a computerized equivalent of breathing a sigh of relief, only to take back all those ones and zeros in a horrified gasp as he noticed a tall, wiry, framed figure before him. It hadn't worked. SCP-096 had still managed to follow him into Minecraft. Even in a world of computer code, the Shy Guy was able to dispatch its digital observer quite easily, and what had once been a living human mind in the form of binary code was quickly deleted. But that's when SCP-096 started to take notice of its surroundings. With the most recent person to see it gone, it had the chance to actually take in where it was. The bright rays of warm light coming down from a cube-shaped sun reveal a welcoming landscape all around, constructed entirely from cubes. It fascinated SCP-096, instilling a kind of childlike wonder in the Shy Guy, the likes of which it hadn't experienced since well, since it couldn't remember when. Rather than leaving, instantly reappearing in its containment chamber, SCP-096 made the conscious decision to start exploring. There was a mountainous biome surrounding SCP-096, stony spires reaching up towards a clear sky, with a waterfall cascading its way down the nearest of them. At the foot of the mountains was the opening of a cave, which the Shy Guy found itself wandering towards. The light from the sun, while a pleasant and welcoming change to the surroundings it was used to, was a little harsh on SCP-096's sunken eyes. So instead, it began to gravitate towards the shadowy confines of the caves, not unlike the usual darkness of its containment chamber back at the Foundation. Traversing through long, winding corridors of stone, SCP-096 found itself having to bend down to avoid hitting its head on the cave's low ceiling. Obviously, this formation of rocky blocks had informed with someone of the Shy Guy's height in mind. There was a low, warm glow coming from the farthest side of the tunnel, and the thin creature made its way closer and closer, despite the stone walls around it feeling like a tighter confinement than its cell. Approaching the source of the light, SCP-096 was relieved that the cave opened out into a more spacious area, the cramped tunnel giving way to an expansive chamber that lay within the heart of the mountain. The warm, orangey glow that had been coming from a flowing stream of boiling hot lava that seemed to trickle down from somewhere above, creating a deadly, fiery pool directly in the Shy Guy's path. But just before it could turn back and leave the cave through the way he came, SCP-096 sensed that familiar feeling of something observing him. Across the lava pool on the other side was a creature comprised of a green cube for a head, with a long, armless cuboid body and four cubed feet. If it had been present in the real world, it might have been made out of leaves like a living shrub. It was staring directly at the Shy Guy from across the lava, only for this strange newcomer to disappear a moment later. 
the creeper hissed, before it realized that SCP-096 had leaped up behind it to land a fatal blow. But little did the infamously anxious anomaly realize that the sentient shrub wasn't done. There was a colossal boom that caused SCP-096 to stagger backwards, whimpering at the sudden loud explosion and the pain that had accompanied it. The creeper had blown itself to pieces, but in doing so, had left a lasting injury that caused SCP-096 considerable discomfort as it began limping towards the cave that led out the opposite side of the mountain. Despite its injury, the Shy Guy was still able to move with relative ease, and the further it went, the more it seemed to gradually heal. However, it was as it stepped out once more into the sunlight that the creature realized just how hungry it was. Back in the real world, it hadn't eaten for several hours, and surprisingly, even while accidentally stuck in digitized form, the hunger mechanics of Minecraft were having an effect on SCP-096. The Shy Guy started searching around for anything that could prove to satiate its hunger. There was a grove of trees not far, so SCP-096 lumbered to take a closer look. It couldn't be certain, but it felt there was at least a slim chance that there were apples growing amongst the leaves. But even at the anomaly's own elongated height, it couldn't simply reach up to pick them. However, it was while swiping its arms up at the tree that the Shy Guy swung its fist and knocked at the tree trunk. To the creature's surprise, it was able to chip away at the wood with its hands, punching at the tree until the trunk had been reduced to a collection of wooden blocks that the Shy Guy was able to collect. And sure enough, some red apples dropped from the leaves above, enough to quell the hunger that SCP-096 was feeling, at least for the time being. Nearby, something was moving through the trees. It was yet to lock eyes on SCP-096, but the second it did, the mob would surely have sealed its own fate. As it moved around, minding its own business, the tall figure overheard the sounds of the Shy Guy eating, and its attention was drawn to where the creature was standing, enjoying an apple. Sensing that it had been seen, SCP-096 turned and locked eyes with the entity. It was perhaps the only other being in Minecraft that was a similar height and stature to the anomaly itself. In fact, the pair were strikingly similar. Before SCP-096 could carry out its usual method of attack, the Enderman suddenly teleported out of view. But it was too late now. Both it and the Shy Guy had looked at the other's face. Both had been provoked and were compelled to react in exactly the same way. Just as SCP-096 entered its rage state, the Enderman too opened its mouth and began to shake, making loud, lengthy sounds not dissimilar to the Shy Guy's own angered screams. But something profoundly strange happened next. SCP-096 and the Enderman kept attempting to pursue one another, appearing in a new location within the Minecraft world, neither one getting close enough to the other. They'd teleport, only for the other to teleport away the moment they saw each other, each trying to catch one another but always staying one step behind. This rapid chase almost became a strange, ongoing sort of teleporting dance between SCP-096 and the Enderman. At first, the Shy Guy had been compelled to attack the Enderman, like it was with any who looked directly at it. But as they appeared and disappeared from place to place, the creature started to feel an odd kinship with this shadowy fellow. It was so used to being frightened and alone, to its overwhelming feelings of insecurity and self-loathing, that the simplicity of just traversing the open world, with a creature very like itself in many ways, it had all come as a welcome change. SCP-096 found it therapeutic even, and before long was following the Enderman not out of any intention to do it harm, but just to feel, for a little while, like it had a friend. Just a little bit longer, SCP-096 thought, welcoming the enjoyment it felt playing this game of Minecraft. There were a few rumors after the break of day came. Whispers that were passed on from the lips of trader caravans as they traveled from settlement to settlement. Not many people would have believed it way back then. It sounded just like a legend out of an old western. Too good to be true. A shadowy stranger wandering the wasteland, righting wrongs wherever he finds them. Then when the job's done and innocent people are safe once more, he walks off into the horizon without asking for so much as a thank you. Like we said, folks would have a hard time believing such a fanciful tale. Of course, that was before the sun started shining an anomalous light over the world. Nowadays, people might believe anything. 
The earliest days of this strange new world proved to be a learning experience for SCP-4494, otherwise known as the Spectre. He was the physical embodiment of the very notion of fighting crime. Wherever injustice arose, he would appear to vanquish those that preyed on the innocent. While he usually manifested at night, he never used to have any trouble appearing in the daytime too, in the form of a shadowy figure wearing a wide-brimmed hat and a long, flowing coat that he could alter the length of for added dramatic flourish. The specter's form absorbed almost all the light from the visible spectrum, but after day broke, the rules seemed to have changed. One day, the specter had emerged to find the sunlight had become unbearable. Where he had once been a void of any and all light, he was now finding it impossible to manifest during daylight. The moment that the unrelenting light from the sun made contact with him, SCP-4494 would dissipate, yet he kept reappearing at night. It was like he was being pulled back into existence and was only able to re-manifest in the moonlight. Despite it being a reflection of the anomalous sunlight, that was seemingly enough to negate the effects it had of preventing SCP-4494 from reappearing. The same could not be said for any humans caught in the light, though. A far worse fate awaited them. Even with much of mankind deformed into creatures that resembled melted wax, there were still pockets of survivors. And where there were human beings, there would be subsects that wanted to harm or exploit their fellow man. The world might have no governing bodies anymore, no law and order, but the Spectre had realized that even in a lawless world, his work was not done. As long as there were survivors of the break of day, they still would need saving, not just from the fleshy hordes of SCP-001-A roaming the wastes, but saving from each other. Striding through the remains of the old world in the dead of night, his long cloak billowed out behind him. Its shadow almost seemed to blend with the darkness that surrounded the Spectre. But on the horizon, there was a sight he didn't often see these days. Light. Not coming from the sun above, nor the moon, but instead it lay ahead of him, a fire glowing not too far away. As he wandered closer, like an outlaw striding into town, SCP-4494 was presented with the ruins of a small settlement. Around him, shacks burned, their boarded-up windows broken to allow the cursed sunlight in. Everyone that was still alive normally kept themselves wrapped up head to toe to block out the sun. But there were clothes and protective goggles strewn all around, a larger pile of garments fueling a bonfire. SCP-4494 had witnessed the SCP-001-A creatures attacking humans dragging them out into the light to be transformed into more anomalous abominations. But what had happened here didn't seem to be the work of those creatures. The Spectre's suspicion were confirmed when he approached the town square to find a group of people who had all been melted into a fleshy mass. The instance of SCP-001-A paid the crime fighter little mind. It couldn't move very far. The few vaguely human shapes that protruded out of it looked like they were tethered to poles in the middle of the settlement. It didn't take much longer for SCP-4494 to figure out what had happened here. Someone had ransacked the settlement for some unknown reason. Maybe they wanted something. Maybe they were opportunists just looking to take advantage of this new post-apocalyptic world. Or perhaps they wanted to be cruel to these settlers. They had broken the barricades over the windows that blocked out the sunlight. They had trashed the ramshackle homesteads that these innocent settlers had been residing in. As SCP-4494 looked further, there looked to have been looting too. Food and water, medical supplies and ammunition. Not anything of use to be found. All that was left was what these raiders hadn't any need for. But as if all that hadn't been enough, as if robbing the settlers for what little livelihood they had left wasn't enough cruelty, the bandits had tethered the survivors to poles in the center of town. They had taken away their protective gear and left them at the mercy of the elements. And as the sun had crept higher into the sky and bathed the captive settlers in its unforgiving light, they had melted into an SCP-001-A creature. Turning away from the town, the Spectre did his best to quell his rage. He wandered in the direction of the next settlement. Something was drawing him there. He could feel the pull of the wrongdoers that had left this carnage in their wake. He would find them, 
and they would pay for what they had done. There was nothing he could do for their last victims. They had already been turned by the sunlight. But if anyone could save the next group of survivors, it was him. As the wind howled, the shadowy figure's cloak flapped in the breeze. The next settlement looked similar to the last, although still intact. Shacks built from sheets of corrugated iron and other scrap metal, all welded together so that not even as little as a tiny beam of sunlight could bleed through. As he stepped toward the boundary of the settlement, a muzzle flashed, accompanied by the deafening echo of a gunshot that reverberated all around. Someone had tried to shoot at the Spectre, narrowly missing. The bullet whizzed past his head, not that it would have harmed him anyway. Fear not, he declared. You can hold your fire. I mean you no harm. You aren't with the slivers? A voice called in the nightly dark. If you mean the evildoers that left that last settlement over a smoldering ruin, then no, I'm not. The Spectre replied. Hearing this, he spotted movement on one of the shack's rooftops. A sharpshooter, carrying a worn old rifle, stood up, covered in layers of protection from the transformative effects of the sun's light reflected off the moon. Well, you aren't dressed like they are, I'll give you that, the sharpshooter called. Can barely make you out wearing all those dark clothes, mister. But if you're looking to trade, I'm afraid your timing couldn't be much worse. Tell me, replied the specter, bluntly. The criminals that terrorized the other settlement, they've been here too? Yes, sir, the man answered. Said they'd be back tonight, too. I've come to help, to do away with those that would inflict justice on the innocent, SCP-4494 explained in his typically dramatic cadence. You call them slivers, yes? Well, they call themselves that, the sharpshooter said, on account of their choice in outfits. They look ridiculous, but they've covered their protective clothing in slivers of metal and glass. That way they're not only protected from light, but their clothes reflected back at other people too. Dastardly villains taking advantage of what has befallen the sun. The Spectre cursed the bandits. Why are they yet to pillage your settlement? You said they intended to return? Well, that's what they threatened earlier. A lot of them have been ransacking any settlement they can't shake down. They showed up here in their stupid, sparkling outfits and demanded we hand over a half of all of our food, water, and antibiotics. They call it their sunshine tax. According to them, if we didn't meet their demands, they'd destroy the town. We didn't know to take them seriously until we saw the fire over there on the horizon. For a moment, the specter fell silent. His cloak had slowed, waving gently now the winds had died down. But in contrast, his anger had never been higher. Who are you anyway, mister? The sharpshooter asked. Never got your name. My name is the Specter, a name these vagabonds will soon know well. For tonight, they will pay the price for their crimes. No offense, Mr. Um, Mr. Specter, but look around. World's gone to hell, ain't no justice anymore. What price are you expecting to make them pay? Simple, SCP-4494 answered. The price is they now have to face me. An hour later, the settlement was quiet. The sharpshooter was still at his post, scanning the area nearby for signs of movement. Sure enough, he spotted something. A group of figures approaching, the moonlight glinting off their metallic outfits, revealing their position as they drew closer and closer to the makeshift town. The slivers were coming, but there would be something else waiting for them when they made their way into the settlement. The other settlers were awake, despite how late it was, wearing their protective layers and peeking through cracked doors only to slam them shut as the glimmering gang crossed the threshold into their ramshackle home. The slivers whooped and jeered, brandishing weapons and threatening the settlers to show themselves before the bandits would break into their shacks and do to them what they'd done to their neighbors at the other town. But as one of the slivers approached the door of a shack and began pounding his boot against the metal door, something reached out of the shadows and grabbed him. In fact, it wasn't coming from the shadows. It was the shadows. Fists shrouded in darkness struck the remorseless raider. Even with the protective layers covering his face, the sliver could feel himself being bruised by the beating. The specter struck once more, knocking the wrongdoer unconscious and wrenching the reflective metals from his outfit, shattering them underfoot. The other slivers panicked, one drawing a handgun and firing. The shots were useless. All they did was illuminate the silhouette of a dark cloaked figure walking closer and closer ready to make them suffer for their crimes. It was dusk by the time the Spectre had beaten the group of bandits, stripping them of their distinctive reflective pieces. Each one of the slivers had been beaten into submission, suffering broken ribs, black eyes, and missing teeth. With the danger over, 
the sharpshooter and the other settlers had emerged from their hiding places, all eager to weigh in on how best to punish the bandits. Many yelled that they should be strung up without their protective gear, so that the sun melted them into an SCP-001-A. But the Spectre interjected, urging the settlers not to sink to the level of the criminals they had been harassed by. Instead, he turned to the defeated slivers. Turn over half of your food, water, and medical supplies to these people, SCP-4494 demanded in a frighteningly calm voice. Then leave, walk into these wastes, and don't come back. The slivers agreed and fled, running as fast as they could away from the town. Why'd you let them go? The sharpshooter asked. These are uncertain times, the specter replied, noticing the sun was creeping over the horizon. It'd be time for him to go soon. In the face of hardship, it can be easy to lose our way. Justice has always been blind, not blinded by the sunlight, but blind to prevent bias. Ah, the slivers might come back though, the man said, adding, if they can even survive with what you left them. Maybe they'll live out there, SCP-4494 responded. Then again, perhaps not, but they have a chance. That is justice. In a time without law, it's the best we can offer. And if they carry on raiding folks? If they harm others, if they want to waste the chance they've been given, then that is their choice. But they know if they refuse to change, then they will answer to the specter. With that, the shadowy crime fighter walked away from the settlement. The unforgiving light of the sun made him fade as he sauntered off like an old gunslinger. But he would be back. As long as people needed saving, he would always be back. The entire foundation was in turmoil. Researchers were getting into heated fistfights with security officers, who in turn were retaliating in fits of unbridled animalistic rage. The facility had erupted into such a frenzy, with chairs being hurled across testing chambers and armories raided for weapons, to escalate the brawl into a far deadlier incident. Tables were overturned and used as cover as the Foundation's own staff turned on each other and before long an all-out war had erupted. But this wasn't a battle of one side versus another. No, this was a wild and rampant free-for-all. Everyone was out to get everyone else, viewing their own colleagues as mortal enemies. And it was all thanks to Junior, the spawn of the Shy Guy. Only a month before, the Foundation had been subject to another bout of chaos, although this one was much more subdued than the explosive battle that would later sweep the facility. Everyone was abuzz. Researchers ignored their work, and some security personnel even abandoned their posts to see what all the fuss was about. Something was very wrong with SCP-096. The creature was normally docile unless directly observed. It spent the majority of its time just pacing around in its containment chamber or staying hunched over in a fetal position, crying to itself. In fact, it was so often sobbing quietly and making all manner of discontented noises that this became known as its usual behavior. At first, almost nobody had noticed that something was even amiss. All seemed right with the miserable monster, that is, until the screaming started. It was a loud, shrieking sound that pierced the eardrums of whoever heard it, then proceeded to climb down their spine and bring a chill to their bones, making their blood run icy cold and causing their skin to be littered with goosebumps. The screeching, disturbing noise flooded out of SCP-096's cell, reverberating off of every wall and echoing down every corridor until not one member of Foundation personnel could ignore it. It was unlike anything they'd ever heard from the creature before. This primal howling seemed to put everyone who heard it on edge. Not just because it was unfamiliar, but because everyone uncannily seemed to know what the screams were indicating. Pain. Perhaps even the worst physical pain that SCP-096 had ever felt. What if the Shy Guy was dying? Something had to be done. But therein lay a hurdle to clear first. How could the Foundation help, even offer medical assistance if needed, to a creature they couldn't even safely look at? What options are there for even getting somebody close enough to examine the Shy Guy without it killing them? They were limited. 
but a crowd of the SCP Foundation's best and brightest researchers had already congregated outside the containment chamber, housing 096, after they heard its screams. Surely between them, they could come up with an idea. Hearing the Shy Guy continuing to howl in agony, one researcher came forward and made a suggestion. There was a device another Foundation researcher had developed, codenamed Scramble. Resembling standard-issue night vision goggles, one Dr. Dan had created these scramble goggles to identify 096's face and digitally alter it so that the wearer was unable to see its face. Essentially, it edited out the shy guy's face in real time so that its homicidal rage state couldn't be activated. The use of Dr. Dan's scramble goggles had previously led to a catastrophic incident that claimed the lives of Mobile Task Force Tau-1, also known as Big Brother. The scramble devices allowed the wearer's brain to receive a single nanosecond of SCP-096 unscrambled before the image was altered by the goggles. So, needless to say, since time was running out to help the creature, and there were no other viable options for doing so, the scramble goggles would need some serious refinement, and fast. Working as quickly as they could, the gathered gaggle of researchers requisitioned an old pair of scrambled goggles and started trying to improve them. Tinkering equipment specialists put their heads together with computer science engineers as they coded like crazy, all underscored by the continued screams of SCP-096. Then, without warning, or even a hint of what had happened inside the cell, the screaming suddenly stopped. Everyone outside the containment chamber stopped for a second, falling deathly silent. The goggles were almost ready, but were they too late to save the Shy Guy? The security personnel, who had also gathered in response to the sound, all drew straws, with the officer pulling the shortest being the one tasked with venturing into the containment chamber. He was handed the goggles and instructed that they would blur his version entirely for a few seconds while the scramble software had a chance to work. Then, once the device had double, triple, and quadruple checked the results, the goggles would activate fully and, in theory, work the way Dr. Dan had originally intended. Although the track record of the scramble project meant that the officer was hardly reassured as he entered the dark, dingy containment chamber. He couldn't see a thing ahead of him, his vision totally obscured as the goggles started running the newly updated version of the scramble software. They were untested, so naturally, the security officer's nerves were at peak levels, worried the device might fail, and any second, his eyes would be greeted by the face of SCP-096. He could tell the creature was still alive. There was a low sound of panting breaths coming from the far corner of the chamber, indicating that it hadn't perished, although it might have been injured. A sudden beep from the scramble goggles startled the officer. The device had made its checks and was ready to activate. However, an unexpected message blinked on the heads-up display that read, Warning! Multiple subjects detected! Luckily enough, when the goggles activated, the officer was relieved to see they had worked. SCP-096's face was a grainy, pixelated mess. The creature showed little noticeable sign of any injuries, too, and just seemed to be gently rocking itself in the corner. But quickly, the reason and perhaps even the cause of SCP-096's earlier screams soon became obvious. Though nobody had entered the containment cell before the security officer, it seemed the Shy Guy wasn't alone. Standing at about a third of SCP-096's considerable height was another Shy Guy. Or at least, another version of a creature, almost identical save for being shorter. It wobbled on its elongated legs, like it wasn't quite used to standing upright. It kept both arms outstretched towards SCP-096, almost as though it was reaching out for a hug. But the Shy Guy stayed in the corner, cowering away from the other creature. Through his scramble goggles, the security officer looked on in disbelief at the scene before him. Somehow, completely unpredictably, SCP-096 had spawned an offspring. It had had a baby. There was a general air of disbelief among the assembled staff outside the containment chamber after the security officer had relayed what had happened. Most were quick to write it off as an impossibility. They'd studied SCP-096 for a long time, and it had been the only anomaly known to the Foundation matching its own very particular description. There had been no other sighted in the wild. It didn't seem to be part of a species, as far as anyone knew. But other researchers refuted this claim, given SCP-096's ability to travel at anomalous speeds and kill those that looked at it. It stood to reason there could be others. 
Maybe the Foundation wasn't aware of a whole species of Shy Guys, because anyone who'd ever seen one didn't live long enough to report it. Then someone mentioned that it wasn't entirely unprecedented for anomalies to have offspring either. A long while before, SCP-049, the infamous beak mass plague doctor, had laid an egg which had hatched into SCP-049-J, a smaller version of himself composed of moss and wads of tissue. Trying to apply logical understanding to each and every anomaly was a paradoxical exercise in futility. All anomalies had their own rules, even rules the Foundation had never observed before. After a great deal of deliberation and additional improvements of the scramble technology, a research team was sent into the containment chamber to retrieve SCP-096's progeny. The parent creature was still shying away from its creation, perhaps because it didn't want to raise it in the way that meant the child inherited its deadly sense of self-consciousness. Then again, maybe the shy guy was just afraid of what it had unleashed on an unsuspecting foundation. Initial testing with the offspring creature revealed it was perfectly healthy and seemingly very much unlike its predecessor. Until any official SCP Foundation designation number could be assigned, the team examining it took to calling it SCP-096 Junior, or shortened to simply Junior. Junior regarded the Foundation scientists with curiosity, intrigued by them as well as their surroundings, picking up medical instruments before very carefully placing them back where it found them, treating every item it touched like they had been made of the finest, most delicate glass. One of the researchers likened its movements to that of a lemur or other similar primates, but with the reserved, timid, and docile nature of a well-domesticated pet that was at first. Naturally, the SCP Foundation being the organization that it is, there quickly became an interest in whether Junior displayed the same anomalous traits as SCP-096. Call it curiosity or caution, they wanted to know if it would react the same way when observed without the protection of scramble goggles. So a test was devised, seating a member of D-Class personnel in the same room as Junior, and tasked only with looking at the Shy Guy's spawn. Everyone gathered with bated breath, the research team watching from an observation desk, all of them wearing scramble goggles to blur Junior's face. As a blindfolded D-Class was brought in and stood opposite of Junior, all of them expected that the test would unfold in a particular way, which made it all the more surprising when, as the D-Class's blindfold was removed, nothing happened. Junior regarded the convict with the same general curiosity as it had for everyone else, but beyond that, showed no change in behavior, no wild crying, no murderous rage state, nothing. Are we sure this is actually the Shy Guys kid? <laughs> One of the researchers joked. With the test concluded and then repeated a few extra times for good measure, Junior was deemed a safe class anomaly. Much like SCP-999 or Josie the Halfcat, it was decided that Junior be allowed to wander freely around the facility. While initially a little unnerving to some staff when they first saw him without goggles, people quickly warmed to Junior. He was like a small monkey from a safari park, although with the added benefit of not stealing anyone's iPhone or wallet. But at least, until shortly after. Around nearly a month had passed since Junior's birth, and since then an odd change had been noted in SCP-096. The Shy Guy seemed calmer, more at ease, and far less anxious. What's more, researchers discovered that for the first time ever, he could be observed. However, before they could investigate further, all hell broke loose. It started in the holding cells where D-Classes were housed, initially written off as fights between inmates that got a little too out of hand. But soon the Foundation's own personnel started to violently attack each other. It was sparked at random, a state of animalistic rage that was focused on their fellow staff members, the people they worked with the people who saw them every day, and it didn't stop. Those working at the facility were seemingly possessed by an inescapable urge to harm those around them, as if punishing each other for just looking at them. By the time a mobile task force was ordered to step in and defuse the situation, the scene they arrived to was one of utter chaos. Further examination uncovered that those who had seen Junior's face had been exposed to an anomalous effect. Looking at the creature gave the observer the same rageful reaction to being observed as SCP-096. They were compelled to kill anyone who saw them. However, most insidiously, this didn't seem to take effect instantly. In fact, those affected only entered their collective rage state after everyone in the facility had interacted with Junior at least once. 
almost like it had been waiting to infect everyone. While the remainder of the Foundation mopped up the aftermath of the incident, some theorized that SCP-096 had somehow expelled all its self-consciousness, all of its negative traits into its progeny. This was supposedly why the Shy Guy seemed so much calmer, so much so that it could even be observed. Whether Junior simply couldn't contain all SCP-096's negativity, or intentionally spread it to everyone else around it, it is unknown. The only solution to get things back to normal was to put the Shy Guy's self-consciousness back to where it came from. The Skeld class starship Innovus was still, suspended against a backdrop of stars and the colorful glow of distant nebulas, frozen in the inky void of deep space, calm, at least from the outside. But inside the main hull of the ship was far from the silent stillness of the stars. Pandemonium hit as the sounds of a klaxon reverberated through metal corridors, each whale punctuated by the flash of blood-red warning lights. Blue looked up at the blinking, strobing color and instantly knew what it meant. <sighs> Emergency meeting, he muttered to himself behind the visor of his spacesuit. Blue turned heel and ran, his boots clanging against the metal floor of the corridor. He ran as fast as he could in his spacesuit, arriving, panting to the cafeteria. His breathless wheezes fogged up his visor, but beyond, he could still see the other six fellow members of the ship's crew, or at least he thought all six of them were there. It was only as he walked closer that he spotted someone was missing. White, red, green, orange, yellow, and now blue were all present, but where was pink? You took your time, Blue, White declared. I was over at the lower engine. He panted back. It's further away, sorry I'm late, ran as fast as I could. What's the situation here? Orange asked. Well, I, I think we should wait for Pink to get here before we get into... Red started to say, only to be interrupted. That's why I called the meeting, Green announced. Pink has gone missing. Eh, but that's impossible, Red immediately responded, drawing a glare from White. I saw Pink only a few moments ago. We, we were both over in electrical. To Blue, along with some of the others, that seemed a little bit odd. If Red and Pink had been close to each other, then how had Green known to call the emergency meeting? The room erupted into a brief debate, with White implying in a rather spiteful way that Red knew more than he was letting on. Interjecting, Blue suggested that they all split up and search for Pink, which was quickly shot down. White reminded the rest of the crewmates that their ship was in need of constant maintenance. If they didn't perform the necessary tasks to keep it running, then the Anobis would never reach its destination. Report back here when you're finished, White barked. As they all split off, Blue couldn't help but wonder what had gotten White more agitated than normal. However, little did any of the crew aboard the Anobis realize that they had picked up a stowaway. The creature had been slipping through the ventilation system, curiously watching the assembled group in the cafeteria before they broke away and headed off into the various different areas of the ship. Spotting one of the crewmates, a man wearing a bright orange spacesuit, the thing in the vents felt oddly drawn to him and slithered off down the vents in the direction Orange had been heading. Now, while you might be forgiven for at first expecting this extra passenger to be some kind of alien parasite that uses human bodies as hosts before bursting out of their chest, only to then proceed to kill everything in sight, then you'd be sorely mistaken. Stand down, Sigourney, there are no xenomorphs aboard this ship. No, this slippery little stowaway was none other than the lovable blob of orange slime known as SCP-999, otherwise referred to as the Tickle Monster. Known for being an adorable amorphous anomaly resembling a pile of gelatinous orange matter, SCP-999 has long been considered one of the most harmless and affectionate SCPs ever catalogued. It has a habit of honing in on the nearest person and leaping right at them not as a means to attack them, or attach any scary eight-legged, egg-laying, head-hugging creature to any faces. Instead, SCP-999 offers a loving embrace and wholesome nuzzling to a person's face, all the while emitting soothing gurgling and cooing noises, as well as pleasant scents that change depending on what the person it's hugging finds most appealing or calming. While not in any way harmful, and only ever acting out of the most well-meant intentions, SCP-999 had been the one responsible for Pink's disappearance. The Tickle Monster had been discovered by Pink while he was traveling through a corridor past the medbay, taking the longer route back to Electrical. There, 999 had playfully pounced on the crewmate to offer a hug, 
This had caused Pink to experience the full effect of SCP-999's anomalous properties, slipping into an overwhelmingly elated state. So, while not currently injured, he was calmly relaxing in a hidden corner of the medbay, with the rest of the crew completely unaware of what was going on. SCP-999 had spotted orange and had been able to recognize the same color as its own jello-like body. Drawn to the crewmate, the tickle monster snuck towards orange while his back was turned, busy cleaning out the filters in the O2 chamber. Before he could turn around and spot the creature, SCP-999 leapt to orange and lured into the medbay with pink. Not long after, Blue had finished up his latest task, fixing up the wiring and storage. Brushing off his hands, he began casually walking back in the direction of the cafeteria, only to see the crimson of red spacesuit zip past. He was rushing down the corridor, almost like he had just been caught, well, red-handed. Something didn't seem right, Blue thought to himself. Red had seemed pretty indignant earlier when Pink had vanished. Although he couldn't say with any certainty if it was because Red really did know what was going on or if they were just nervous. Returning to the cafeteria, however, the crew quickly realized that Orange was now gone too. I'm calling it now, White declared. This was you, Red. You're up to something. I swear I'm not, Red pleaded. It was hard to see how sincere his expression was through the tinted space helmet visor. Well, if anyone else knows anything or saw anything, then come forward, White said to the group. The rest of the crew were awkwardly shuffling on their feet, each one clearly uncertain, but nobody wanting to come forward and be the first to speak. Actually, I, um, <clears throat> Blue found themselves saying. I saw Red dashing around in the corridor. He seemed like he was in a hurry, or maybe he was up to something. M maybe. Look, it doesn't prove anything. You don't know that, Yellow chimed in. Who knows, he may have been eyeing you up as his next victim. Victim? Red exclaimed. Look, I don't know what you're implying here. I haven't killed anyone. Nobody said Pink and Orange were dead, White replied. Unless you know more than you're letting on. I swear, I don't know what's happening. I'm just in the dark as you all are, Red insisted. In that case, prove it, Green interjected bluntly. Prove you didn't kill Orange and Pink. How? Red yelled. How can I prove that? You could prove they're both still alive, said Yellow, completely unaware that Pink and Orange were actually still alive. He can't prove it, White announced solemnly, because I bet they're not even on the ship anymore. The missing crewmates were, in actuality, still aboard the ship. In fact, they were having the time of their lives inside the medbay with SCP-999, but that hadn't stopped the rest of the crew turning on Red. Come on, Red, Blue sighed. I mean, you've got to admit you're acting a little, well, not suspicious, but definitely evasive. Oh, sure. What, just because I'm wearing red, you all think I'm some kind of murderous traitor? Red shouted, his desperate, pleading tears obscured by his helmet's visor. This is McCarthyism! Look, why don't you just give us a straight answer? Blue offered, trying to remain reasonable and not join the rapidly growing witch hunt. Because I'm scared, Red insisted. Scared that we'll find out? White yelled, leaping at Red and pinning him down. Quick, the rest of you grab his arms and legs! A struggle ensued, with Red desperately kicking and flailing about. While Green and Yellow gripped an arm and leg, Blue was reluctant. He wanted to urge everyone to calm down and not do anything irrational, but it was already too late. If he opposed, the blame might shift to him. Under White's direction, the crew lifted Red up and carried him to the Anobis's outer airlock. They threw Red past the inside door, which slammed shut behind him as he turned and started slamming his hand against the surface, begging for them to let him out. His pleas fell on deaf ears as White threw a nearby switch. The outer door of the airlock opened, and the vacuum of space pulled Red out of the ship, practically firing him out of the hull like a cannon, leaving him to drift away, alone, and with limited oxygen in his spacesuit. Right, now that imposter's been dealt with, everyone get back to work, White announced. We need to keep this ship in a fit state to move. Blue was speechless. He thought they were just going to hold Red prisoner in a secure part of the ship until he calmed down. Instead, he'd aided his crewmates in murdering one of their own. Even the very thought of it made Blue feel sick. And he would have been if he wasn't wearing a space helmet. It all happened so fast. He'd barely had enough time to consider all the facts. After all, White had seemed adamant from the very start that Red was somehow responsible for Orange and Pink disappearing, but he had no concrete evidence to base that assumption on. 
Then again, where were those missing crewmates? There had been no sign of them, no bodies or discarded suits. Maybe they weren't on the ship at all anymore. What if White was right and Red had killed them? Or worse, what if White had been the one responsible and Blue had just helped him kill an innocent spaceman to cover up his cruel misdeeds? Of course, the surviving crew were so wrapped up in the horrifying moral and ethical implications of the situation that none of them had thought to check the medbay. Meanwhile, SCP-999 had found two more new friends, Green and Yellow. The pair had seemed rather glum, since they had just helped kill Red, and so the orange blob of good vibes had sought them out. Now, the two of them, plus Orange and Pink, who were still fine, were all enjoying the company of the Tickle Monster in the Med Bay. At the same time, though, Blue was returning from his task of uploading data over an admin, to find only White left waiting for him in the cafeteria. Neither one of them said anything. They'd both already made up their minds. In each one's head, the other was the real guilty party, the culprit responsible for the disappearances and apparent deaths of the other crewmates. Both Blue and White were convinced that the other was truly the imposter among us. Oh, God. In rage, they charged at each other. Rather than act rationally, maybe by sticking together and searching the rest of the ship, the two spacemen engaged each other in a scuffle. You're sus! Blue roared, punching White in the stomach, causing him to stagger backwards. I'm not the one who's sus! White wheezed, rushing back towards Blue and shoulder barging him into the cafeteria floor. You are! You're sus, Blue! They continued their scrap trading blows until Blue was able to throw a punch that cracked the glass visor of White's helmet. There was a hiss as the air escaped, and White was desperately fumbling with his helmet trying to plug the crack. Blue was able to grab him by his oxygen tank and drag him towards the airlock. Blasting his adversary out into the unforgiving cold emptiness of space, Blue staggered through the ship. He was certain that he had received a broken rib during the fight and hobbled along the corridors towards Medbay. When the entrance opened, he stared in disbelief at what he saw. Sat inside were the entire crew, minus the pair who'd been ejected from the airlock, of course. Pink, orange, green, and yellow were playing with a friendly blob of orange slime that seemed to have the energy and enthusiasm of a pet dog. The crewmates were laughing, hugging the tickle monster, and engaging in tickle fights, clearly in a state of heightened elation. In a sudden instant of realization, the horror caught up with Blue. He had just murdered White and Red for nothing. Both of them were innocent. In fact, nobody on the ship was actually missing. Just before this horrifying epiphany caused Blue to suffer an emotional breakdown, SCP-999 glided across the floor towards him, smiling. As he knelt to pat the orange blob on the head, Blue suddenly felt better about the two deaths he'd been responsible for. Actually, he felt great, compelled to start giggling uncontrollably as he joined his fellow surviving crewmates in playing with the stowaway SCP-999. Although thanks to that delightful distraction, not one of the remaining astronauts realized that their ship was still adrift in space, heading right towards a sun. Hello, one and all, and welcome back to the Anomatron 6000, our patented device for projecting any seemingly improbable scenario for your viewing indulgence. And today, we decided to do something slightly different with it. Here at SCP Explained, we usually activate the Anomatron to bring you encounters between the anomalous denizens of the SCP universe and other fictional characters, like Doctor Strange fighting the Scarlet King or Abel crossing paths with Batman. But this Anomatron experiment is one of our more unusual, to say the least. If you've been subscribed to us for a while, some of you might remember our video, What if SCP-096 was put inside SCP-914? In it, the Shy Guy was tricked into entering the input booth of the anomalous refinement machine during a containment breach. What emerged was maybe the handsomest man to ever live, beautiful both on the outside and within. A lot of our comments pointed out that this refined version of 096 felt akin to a Giga Chad, and that got us thinking. What if SCP-096 was to encounter the real Giga Chad? Well, the Anomatron 6000 has a few different answers for us. Scenario 1, or as we like to call it, the obvious outcome, pits the thin humanoid anomaly against the man behind the meme. Ernest Kalimov is a Russian fitness trainer and model, forever immortalized in the annals of internet history by a series of black and white photoshopped pictures that garnered him the nickname of Gigachad. 
Thanks to his practically perfect 90-degree jawline and muscular physique, Kalimov seemingly unknowingly became the archetype for the ultra-masculine, handsome man. However, the man behind the GigaChad meme is still just a man. The infamous photos of him were heavily edited for an art project known as Sleek in Tears. And while Ernest does sport some impressive muscles from all his time at the gym, that strength isn't enough to save him from the shy guy. After all, he is still just a man. According to the Anomatron's predictions, the most likely outcome if the two were ever to meet would end pretty similarly to the grim fate of many others who have gazed upon the face of SCP-096. The moment Ernest looks at the creature, he would, in all likelihood, activate 096's rage state. His physique and above-average level of fitness might give him a slight advantage, allowing him to perhaps outrun the shy guy for longer than most, but ultimately, Ernest Kalimov would be able to run, but not hide, from SCP-096. The creature would track him down and hone in on him with anomalous speed, dispatching him before returning to its usual docile sobbing state. The result? An SCP-096 victory. Now we know what you're thinking, is that really it? We had the same reaction too. But hold on for a minute. After giving the machine an additional set of variables, we were able to get a few more interesting outcomes out of the Anomatron. Which brings us to the result that we've given the title of Scenario 2, Shy Harder. Of course, Ernest Kalimov might be the face of an internet meme and ultimately just a very strong Russian man in comparison to the anomalous traits of SCP-096, but the GigaChad? The GigaChad is more than a man so much more than the sum of its parts. Existing within the online zeitgeist since as early as 2017, the GigaChad is far more powerful than a mere mortal. He doesn't just represent idealized standards of over-exaggerated masculinity like the action movie heroes of the 1980s. The GigaChad embodies those ideas. He is the very notion of a physically perfected human specimen given form. You may not like it, but peak performance doesn't even come close to the GigaChad, and neither does SCP-096. Even at the top of its game, the creature quite literally pales in comparison to its imposing opponent. In Scenario 2, Shy Harder, the Anomatron 6000 predicted that if the two were to meet, the scales would tip in the complete opposite direction from the first outcome. For that was SCP-096 against the man, but against the meme himself. Well, this fight is no contest. As a matter of fact, it's hardly even a fight, certainly not a fair one, and instead is more of an execution. From the moment the unstoppable tower of muscle and perfect angular jawline that is the GigaChad clasps eyes on SCP-096, it's practically the beginning of the end. The shy guy doesn't even lift, bro. But GigaChad can bench one million times his own body weight in his sleep. So when SCP-096 comes racing towards him, intent on killing him just for looking at its screeching wide-jawed face, the GigaChad does what the GigaChad does best. He lifts. Grabbing SCP-096 with ease as it comes to him screeching, GigaChad casually hoists the creature off the ground. Although he's only using the tiniest portion of his immense and infinite strength, it's more than enough force to send the Shy Guy soaring upwards, crashing through multiple ceilings as it's sent hurtling up the numerous floors of the Foundation facility above. Of course, being lifted is hardly going to kill the Shy Guy outright. The creature is known to be invulnerable, after all. But it's not like GigaChad can go down easily, either. Don't forget, this is no mere mortal, but an internet meme incarnate. And on the internet, nothing ever dies. His perpetual existence as part of online history aside, the GigaChad is so strong that no doubt his abs could withstand the firepower of any conventional weapon. Realizing that even if it could reach him, it couldn't even scratch the GigaChad, SCP-096 would undoubtedly begin a downward spiral. The Shy Guy is a creature so insecure in itself and its appearance that it kills anyone who so much as glances at its face in photos. So being presented with the living embodiment of an idea it could never even hope to attain, the biceps, the perfect right-angled jawline, it's all too much. Sending SCP-096 into a complete meltdown, the creature would be neutralized once and for all by the very existence of the GigaChad, resulting in his victory. Okay, so we're one point to SCP-096 and one to GigaChad. 
and most people would maybe consider leaving it there. But not us. We wanted more than that. You see, we quickly realized that the Anomatron's second scenario was based on a lot of earlier iterations of the GigaChad meme. Don't get us wrong, that version of the Ultimate Man could still easily destroy the Shy Guy. But around March of 2021, the infamous photoshopped images of Ernst Kalimov started to be used in slightly different formats. That's the thing about memes. They're not only immortal, forever logged in the ancient texts of the Wayback Machine and compilation videos here on YouTube, but memes are also adaptable. They can evolve and change, finding new variations as time goes on. As such, the average fan versus average enjoyer meme saw a new use of the GigaChad. Before, the GigaChad, this notion of the ideal ultra-masculine specimen was based on, let's be honest, some pretty outdated ideas about what it means to be a man. After all, it takes more than muscle to be a man. Not every man or masculine presenting person has to work out until they're built like a brick wall. Perhaps the real measure of a man is how sincere, sensitive, and supportive you can be, as well as standing by your interests rather than caving to old societal standards of masculinity. And after we updated our data, the Anomatron 6000 was able to give us a new revised outcome, or what we like to call Scenario 3, the average SCP-096 enjoyer. In this projection, the GigaChad's true strength isn't just his masculine physique and his unattainable standards. Instead, it's, in part, the inherent adaptability of his status as a meme, but also his compassion. Just like before, he's more than able to resist SCP-096's attacks, and the creature's insecurity comes out, put on full display when presented with GigaChad's sharp jawline. But rather than overcome his anomalous adversary by fighting him, this scenario sees the GigaChad comforting the Shy Guy. Through calm empathy and words of affirmation, he reminds SCP-096 that true acceptance of oneself comes from within, and that message strikes a chord with the creature. In a turn of events none of us saw coming, the GigaChad offers to help SCP-096 overcome his crippling and deadly sense of insecurity. The pair start using the on-site gym together, after hours when there aren't any innocent Foundation personnel around. There, Giga Chad not only offers to introduce SCP-096 to an exercise regimen, if that's what the creature wants, but also helps the Shy Guy work on his confidence. They form a friendship, with SCP-096 taking a liking to working out, not because it wants to be buff like its new friend, the GigaChad, but more so because doing so makes it feel more comfortable in its own skin. SCP-096 gradually starts to like itself more, even eating healthier thanks to GigaChad's advice. Eventually, the Shy Guy begins looking far more content and even starts to develop self-confidence. It's not often that a story involving SCP-096 exists with the creature getting to achieve some semblance of happiness. Well, there is one that comes to mind. The very same Shy Guy story that sent us on this particular streak of pitting it against the GigaChad in the first place. But what if we put them together? Would coming across a refined SCP-096 spell the end for the GigaChad? Or would the muscular, masculine meme undo the Shy Guy's previous happy ending? Well, according to the Anomatron 6000, neither. When we last left him, after being turned into a handsome, nine-foot-tall man, SCP-096 had just started going by the name David. SCP-978, the desired camera, had been used to photograph the refined Shy Guy. It showed him holding hands with the Foundation scientist responsible for his transformation, who had studied the new and improved SCP-096 in great detail. She had quite the understanding of him. But perhaps the photograph from the Desire camera was more of a metaphor, and what SCP-096, or David, really desired wasn't specifically the researcher who'd studied him, but a partner who understood him. Someone to call an equal. Enter the GigaChad. According to the calculations made by the Anomatron, the embodiment of ultimate masculinity, both strong and sensitive, came bursting into the Foundation facility. There, the moment he and David saw each other was like the meeting of an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Neither one rushed to solve the encounter with violence. Both the GigaChad and SCP-096 appreciated each other's aesthetic appeal. Both were remarkably handsome, and one couldn't bear the thought of ridding the world of the other. Instead, 
it was love at first sight. Both David, formerly known as SCP-096, and the GigaChad fell head over heels in love with each other, and looking at both, it was not hard to see why. They were a pair of fine, perfectly chiseled fellas, and they instantly hit it off. The newly established couple enjoyed each other's company, spending time in deep conversations, SCP-096 introducing his new partner to his friends at the Foundation, while GigaChad was comfortable with his own masculinity to express his feelings towards David without fear or judgment. No relationship is perfect, of course. For a short time, a sliver of David's old self re-emerged. The shy guy in him worried that perhaps his relationship with the GigaChad was based purely on both of their extreme good looks, and was nothing more than superficial. But by being an embodiment of healthy, idealized masculinity, the GigaChad was able to sense something was wrong with David, and rather do the insecure thing of letting it fester, he addressed it directly, and they discussed the issue in a healthy, mature, and constructive way. Not just so they could put SCP-096's worry to rest, but so that both of them could further strengthen their relationship and grow as people. And of course, GigaChad wasn't just attracted to SCP-096's refined good looks. Far from being superficial, he recognized that David was a complete person, beautiful both inside and out, and loved him as a whole, not just because they were both conventionally attractive on the surface. SCP-096 and the GigaChad stayed together for the rest of their lives, or as we decided to name this fourth scenario from the Anomatron, happily ever after. Now go and check out Can SCP-096 Chase Its Victims Across the Multiverse? And SCP-096 Tale, A Lesson in Power for more SCP-096.